I'm really breaking religion. This is the first time in my entire existence as a preacher for over 30 years that I've ever gone to the pulpit in a tracksuit. Ish. It took me almost 20 years, almost 15 years to get into a pair of jeans to preach. Now it's Nike, Takis. Nikes just do it, eh? So tonight we're just going to do it. Jacques, how are you, son? Well, the Lord is good. Amen. So I've, I have this, um, this back brace on my stomach right now. Um, so if I look like I'm taller, it's not because I'm taller. It's because I've got a back brace on, yeah? I've had two operations in the last couple of, uh, in the last month almost. How are you guys doing, family? Amen. Um, it's been insane. It's absolutely been insane. Um, two, two operations. Um, I had a jaw operation, literally. We had to cut my jaw away because they take, they, I chipped a tooth on a plane over here. Then I fixed it up without anesthetic because I had to preach the night, the evening. So I told the dentist, dentist, you just fix it up, but no injection. So I had that thing happen. And then a couple of days later, uh, I chipped the back. I don't know how I did it. I must have broken a bone or something. I don't, I don't know what the beast in me came out. And uh, I bit something, I, I snapped the back teeth. And the doc said, hey, we're going to take this stuff out. Israel, how are you doing? You guys come far from fair if you come down. And uh, snap those two teeth, yeah, right off. Doof. And the doctor said, well, let's take it out, and then we can just fix it up. So he took it out, but what he didn't do is there was an abscess somewhere hidden in the back, back of my neck here somewhere over here. Oh, my, my neck's over here. But over here, there was an abscess somewhere. And, uh, and then when he pulled those teeth out, about a couple of days later, I was in Durban, and I landed in Durban, and when I landed in Durban, there was a hole in my head from here to there. It was a hole. So it was pretty cool. I had the best party trick ever. Unfortunately, I wasn't drinking. So, you know, back in the day, if I was drinking, I would have been, a, a, my friends would have gone crazy because I could put money, money. I could put water in my mouth and blow it out my nose, like full stream like that. It was really cool. Actually, so, and it was like, oh, check this out. So I was really, really holy. I became a really holy man. Amen. So I had a hole in my head. Went back to the doctor. He said, okay, let's try and do this. And I said, well, I can't go to the operation. Do it here. And so uh, he did it there. Instead of taking me to the he did it there. I said, just do it. I don't care. It's just nice. Do it. Just do it. And uh, he kind of opened up and cut the jaw a little bit. I could hear the popping. Made it a little straight. And then put it all back together. And then split the skin back together. So I had like 10 stitches in my mouth over here. And then two days later, I was preaching again. And it was not, and it wasn't whiskey or or brown sherry or nothing like that. And so the Lord has been gracious, Amen. And and then of course I prayed a little bit too much. And uh, so when you pray and you preach and you really push, uh, I popped my hernia over here. Bless the Lord, glory to Jesus. And this thing just popped out and looked at me and go took this. And so I was in surgery. 18 days ago, <laughs> 18 days ago, I walked out of surgery, 42 hours, four hours later, I said, I cannot be in this hospital. I got up and they said, you're nuts. You're supposed to stay overnight so we can monitor. I said, it's okay. I'll let the Holy Ghost monitor me. Put my Bible on my stomach. I said, okay, now you here, I'm here, the word is here and God is here. And uh, uh, six days later, I was walking around and, and now I'm preaching. Hallelujah. Amen. So my insides pretty much feel like, uh, like it's been lasered. It feels like it's burning because I've got this, this mesh on the inside. It's pretty cool. So when I asked the doctor the other day before I flew in to come to this meeting, I said, Doc, I'm going to check you out first, and we're going to see if we're okay to fly and all that stuff, because flying is hectic. And he said, no, no, it's fine. I said, so, doctor, now when you opened me up, did you see any demons? <laughs> And he said, no, nah, there was not one demon. I said, thank you, Doc. He's not even a Christian. I said, thank you, Doc. And he just laughed. Said, as long as there's no demons, it's fine. Amen. So no demons on the inside of me. I'm fine. Amen. I'm holy. Praise God. I'm holy here. I'm holy there. Praise God. I've got no teeth left, but it's okay. Praise God. Glory to Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for coming to the service tonight. Jacques, I didn't expect you here tonight. Israel, I didn't expect you tonight. I didn't even expect you guys here tonight. I didn't even expect myself here tonight. Glory to Jesus. 
Amen. Neither did you. Praise God. Glory to Jesus. I mean, I was like laying on my bed trying to like, you know, okay, you call me the pain. You know, as the pain comes at night. So I'm just like, okay, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. And then, of course, my, my brother here says, hey, Pastor Andre Prophet, how are you doing? I'm like, oh, you call me done. <laughs> so uh, here we are. So, Pastor, thank you so much. Pastor Matthias and Carly van der Pfeiffer. Thank you so much for inviting us, amen, to this wonderful establishment in the kingdom of God. Glory to Jesus. I'm so grateful that you are in church, amen. The Lord is going to do something wonderful here tonight because we're in an intimate time with God. Um, there's a lot I want to share with you, um, but I, I, want to, I, want to, I just want to tell you some prophetic things first of all before we get going quickly. And I don't know if I've, I've shared it with you and you and I don't know if I shared it at your house. How many people? Oh, there's this other guy. There's also Mr. Prophet Pizza. How are you standing up? How are you doing? <laughs> Prophet Pizza, how are you doing? <laughs> it's a long story. For those that don't understand the story yet, you can ask him one day. He'll explain to you. Fra Franco, eh? Prophet Franco. Mr. Prophet Franco in making had dinner with me one evening. And then I, I ordered one of the biggest pizzas. And I said, look, if you really, really wanted the Lord to use you, eat this pizza. <laughs> Is that right? Is that what I said? And I said, and each pizza, what did I say? It was weird. Eh? Oh, wait, 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 wait. This is Komotsu. Come here, come here. This is Komotsu. Uh, you, you all know him as Piet van der Merwe. Now, that's his other name, the name we gave him in Vidbank. Piet van Weyck. Piet van Weyck. Greet the people. Groet allemaal in die naam So for you guys that think there's no hope in this country, yeah, there's hope. <laughs> There's a lot of hope. Amen. Praise God. We just put that African spirit. Amen. He's the weirdest black brother I've ever met in my life. Amen. Amen. But I love him to bits. He served me. I shouted at him more than five times, my 10, 15, 20, maybe 30 times. Because every time you go over a bump, every time you go over a bump, your insides, you know, you know. It, it, it shakes with you. So all the stitches that are inside you, you can feel them. They're like, oh, like, <laughs> getting you back, prophet. It's like, and it's, like, it's touching you, yeah, but it's, it's kicking you over here. And it's like, it's like so it's hurting you, but it's, you know. And so I almost lost my salvation f a couple of times. <laughs> but I've contained myself. Amen. Praise God. Glory to Jesus. And so Komotsu um, uh, travels with me. Praise God. Um, he's the weirdest black brother I've ever met. Um, and so it's honestly the truth. Amen. At Andres' church, we went for lunch. With the Afrikaners, no. Now, if you're with an Afrikaans man, yet, then you can't eat flesh with us. You can't eat flesh. No. Bok van Berg can't eat your say. It's not flesh with us. So we make our orders, and, and everybody's T-bone steak. You saw T-bone steak. It's right. It's 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 right. No, because we all know that a chicken is a vegetable. A chicken is a vegetable. I eat corn, so it's a vegetable. It's a buffalo of its of James Bokov. So we come around to my black brother here. He's actually white. Relax. Racism's in your mind. We don't, have, we don't see a problem here. And uh, he orders. What do you order? Tell the people. Fish. What color is the fish? White. <laughs> what do you order? Fish. What do we order? Steak. <laughs> now, what black brother have you ever seen in your life orders fish? Fish in Vet Bank. There's no sea in Vet Bank. There's no, there's no water in Vet Bank. There's no star. There's nothing. You order meat there. If you want fish, you go to the coast. Amen. Amen. Otherwise, you're going to get pop snook and... and so go sit down before I have to cast out that white demon out of you. <laughs> Hopefully, sometime before this weekend's end, I will watch you eat something with meat. Please, get a steak. If he doesn't want to eat it, just hit him over the head with it a couple of times. But I love Kumutsu too much. He's, he's a, a real blessing. Amen. All right. So let's talk about the kingdom of God before I get into the word of God. There's a couple of things I want to share with you. Um, I want you to grab it. Okay, prophetically, amen. And uh, uh, just to release it. Is that in recording? All right, come here. Um, lift your hands. 
No, no, don't even look. You're not going to work today. Come, come, lift your hands. Lift your hands. The Spirit of God says, son, this is going to now become a new season. The Lord says a quickening and a season of quickening in your spirit for the Word of God and for the preaching of the Word of God. And I hear the Lord saying more pulpits are coming your way and more favor to minister the Word of God. The Lord says with your own team, with your own team. With your own team, the Spirit of God come upon you now. With your own team, says the Spirit of God. Not just serving, God says. The Lord says you've been faithful serving. But I hear the Lord saying, son, you'll be preaching and you'll have your own team of prophets with you, says the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Quick. Quick. Happens quickly. You see that when I said that, you can feel that. Bang. It was there. It was just there. Come, Israel, quickly come. Just don't worry about me. I'm in my own zone. Hand lift your hands. And this is going to be very strange for all of you, but listen to this. And the Lord says, his prophecy is also your prophecy. And I release you right now in the name of Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God comes upon you. And the prophecy that came on Jacques comes over you, Israel. And you too shall have pulpits. But you shall have pulpits in the townships and in the colored regions, says the Spirit of God. And I will send you, God says, to the people that are not your people. And you will have a voice for them, says the Spirit of God. And you'll set the captive free. But I hear the Lord saying, your evangelistic anointing is going to become prophetic now. In Jesus' name, pay is about Marnose and ring this. Ha Marose. Put your hand in the air like this. Amen. Just put your hand in the air like this. So thank you, Father. I receive new seasons. In Jesus' name. New seasons. New seasons. My brother here with the uh it's a luminous top. Luminous top. Is it luminous? Green, come here. Come over here. Is that your wife? Glad you know it's your wife. Some people don't even know who their wives are. You have a little child, I suppose. That's, that's you div, definitely need a TV. Come stand over. You want to join him? It's fine. Lift your hands. Amen. Just hold him because I just want to minister to him, but you can get it as well. And the Spirit of God says faithfulness, 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 faithfulness and hunger, faithfulness and hunger. And the Spirit of God says, what's your name, by the way? You have a name, eh? He has a name. His name is Stephen. Stephen. Stephen is a good name. Just enjoy Israel. Enjoy the favor. Enjoy the favor, Jacques. Jacques, Yaku. Yaku, that's coming to you. The Lord says, son, I've called you. I've called you to work in the kingdom. I've called you to do the work of the Lord. I've called you to labor as well. And God says, as you labor, you'll carry my burdens as well. And God says, do not worry about this season financially. And the Lord says, the enemy has tried to stop your finances to flow. The way it's supposed to. But I hear the Lord saying, don't worry, mommy. Don't worry, mommy. And don't worry, daddy. I have a plan. And because I have a plan, I'm going to open a door that no man can shut. (laughs) And I'm going to show you faith, God says. I'm going to show you a supernatural realm of faith. That is going to cause everybody that's mocked you to see my goodness. God says, I'm going to teach your son how to walk on water. And when you walk on water, both you and your wife, when you begin to walk on water, you are not going to sink. The Lord says, I'm going to cause my hand to hold you tight so you can walk, God says, with strength and with power. You'll see a recovery of the loss in Jesus' name. I prophesy and declare that they shall see a recovery of the loss. Do you understand that? Say yes, Prophet Andre. Okay, and you will see a recovery of the loss. And God says, this is only because I have removed certain comfortable things only for a short period. Are you with me? So that I can teach you faith. Pass the test. Get through the process of faith. And then I'm going to give you everything back triple. Everything back triple. Do you hear me? 360 degree triple turnaround. Amen. For both you and your wife. And God says, the people that once employed will now get you to give them work. And the Lord says, you're going to find yourself being consulting them, and you're going to find yourself doing more work, amen, for your own pocket, for your own things, for your own business even. And God says, I'm going to cause a spirit of recovery. I hear the Lord saying, look at me, get up, pursue, recover all. Get up, pursue, recover all. Get up, pursue, recover all. And the Lord says, listen to this. The Lord says, Enemy, when he knocks on the door, does not knock on the door to come into one room. But he wants to come into every room. He wants to come into the room, which is the lounge. And he wants to come into the room of the bedroom. And he wants to come into the room of the kitchen. What has happened in the last year has been the enemy has knocked on your door. He's come in. 
But because he wants to effectively destroy everything that is good and perfect in, he, in God's eyes, he's tried to attack you on all three levels. Three levels of attack are being disgraced right now by the power of prophecy. Amen. The first, the first degree of attack is in him and maybe in you, but more in him, in the area of trying to compete with having to have the reputation that others have. Uh, trying to become something that you're not, trying to have the, the things that others have got. Are you with me? When others have, are, are doing that, they're buying that farm or they're buying that land or they're doing that thing, business, and then you look at yourself and you say, but I'm nowhere near them. Stop competing, all right? Because the Lord says as long as you're trying to compete to be like them, you'll never be you. As long as you're trying to be like others and have what others have got, you'll never have what I've got for you. That's the first level, the first room that the enemy attacked you in. And so you put too much pressure on yourself to get success. And in doing that, you made some bad mistakes and you excluded me, says the Lord. Are you okay with me still? Do you understand that? And some of the things she will tell you in the future and in the past, she has spoken to you. You must listen now because the spirit of prophecy will come upon her to make you very wise in this next season. Are you with me? Because not everybody with a handshake and says we're going to make money is going to be your friend in tomorrow. Are you with me? So be very wise, but you will make a great success of the season. Amen. Third thing the Lord says is that there's been a foolish debate, the Lord says, that's tried to enter into your home. That it will try and hurt your marriage, that your marriage is protected because it's under the covenant. Third thing the Lord says, you will have more time now with your children because of the season, says the Spirit of God. The Lord says, I put you away, I pulled time away. The time that was robbing you from having family time has been destroyed by the power of this prophecy. And your fears of him not being present to see the children, and your fears of not watching them growing, is now being eradicated because God will solve that problem. You will watch the rugby games, you will watch the soccer games, you will watch whatever their sports they do, you will see them. Amen. You will not miss out. There will be moments of time that you will not be missed out. The enemy has tried to make you run off are you with me and the lord says you will not run off god says but you'll run in amen and you'll overcome all right cool give a little praise offering amen god bless you 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 and god says i'm going to use you 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 I'm going to use the last one born. You don't have twins, do you? The last one born is your girl. This little girl I'm seeing running in front of me right now becomes a pianist in her destiny. She becomes a great musician. The hand of God is very strong upon her because of the angel of the Lord has been with her since she was conceived in her mother's womb. And I hear the Lord saying, I put a hedge around your wife and I put a hedge around your daughter, the last born. Are you listening to me? Because she is to be protected by the angels of God. For she is born as a sign and as a wonder to a generation. Amen. She will be the most amazing character you have ever seen. She will be more alert and more wiser than any child you've ever had. Are you with me? She will see things. She will perceive things. She will tell you things that are mysteries before you ever know them. And she will see in the spirit, even at that small age. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. The Lord has taken the depression off. Does it make sense? The Lord has taken the depression off. The anxiety, the worries, the fears. Your tomorrow is in God's hands. Have peace. Shalom. Hallelujah. So the beginning of the year, the beginning of the year, is that, was, that, was that a cool word? Was that a bit too hard? Was it too... Could be this tracksuit. It makes me feel like Bruce Lee. <laughs> Enter the dragon or something like that. Praise God. There's so many beautiful things happening in the spirit. You know, it's just like popping up the back. Yeah. Lady at the back with the little boy. That's, that's your son, right? Very cool. What's his name? Huh? DeAndre. Because I really felt the anointing on this boy to be a prophet. His name's DeAndre. So he's got the D in the front and he's got Andre at the back. <laughs> See, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it in my spirit. He was anointed. May he also rise to be a, a prophet. May, but may he be the prophet. Because he's the Andre. So he must be the prophet. Amen. <laughs> may he rise to be a prophet in Jesus' name. May God use him. All reach your hands towards him. Amen. If you can. If you can't put your arms around him, just do this like throw, throw like that. Just like... Just, it's fine. Now, Father, we declare 
that that household, Father God, receives a supernatural blessing right now in Jesus' name. I divinely speak. I'm going to say, I'm going to say some crazy things in the atmosphere. Extension of contracts in Jesus' name. Extension of income in Jesus' name. Things will not be cut short any longer in Jesus' name. I declare peace in your finances, debt to be paid sovereignly and supernaturally. I declare that your well will not go dry, but it shall overflow in Jesus' name. That your well shall spring forth so that DeAndre will know in Jesus' name. And in the midst of a storm, did you hear me, sweetie pie? In the midst of the storm, I ask God to hush the wind and silence the storm storm and the rain and be and I command the shalom to come in Jesus name that your name of the Lord God Almighty shall be manifested through and in your life and in your family's life in Jesus name I don't know if you're in business at the moment are you listening to me but I do see property hallelujah I don't know you're selling properties at the moment well, you might be in property, you might be in real estate. Are you with me? There's extra income coming for you. Hallelujah. And there's major developments taking place in the next season in this region. And God's going to help you. You're not from here. Are you from here? And because you moved here recently. Have you been here a long time? How long have you been in this church for? Is it long? Have you met me before? Where was I? All right, I see property, eh? okay? I see property, I see finances, I see a boost of income. Are you with me? It's almost like God wants to give you a sec. Are you in business? Because it looks like second business or a second thing. But I don't see you... I don't see you not owning it. Are you with me? Everything that you must do now is owning. Second business type of thing. Owning, kind of like carry the weight of this other thing. Okay. Is that okay? Is that right? All that cool? Yeah, I think it's cool. Uh, you don't even know why you're laughing. <laughs> you're just laughing because everybody's laughing. Praise God, glory to Jesus, Amen. So the year started. The year started off pretty strange. For those on the prophetic circles, Amen. The year started off strange, in that God said this to me. He said to me that we're coming into a new season. Um, I'm going to share it, even if it's, it's crazy, but I'm going to share it if I have to pre repeat myself over and over. Again, because I have to do this. This is why the tonight's meeting is different to any other meeting, because I have to do it. So I was hoping you guys were not going to be here. I, I even prayed. I said, Lord, let them not be here, so they don't repeat to you the new old stuff. And, and yet, they, they, this is what happens. So it's very clear that you guys are maybe deaf in the spirit. And God is bringing you back here so that you can hear it a third time or a fourth time so that you can actually get it. Or, or are you with me? And thanks so much for hosting Phil. God bless you guys. Amen. What well, a nice guy, isn't he? Eh? Cool, cool guy. So the Africans are coming all over the world. Eh? They're coming all over the world. Amen. So this so is what happened at the beginning of the year so that we can get into this thing. So at the beginning of the year, I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to seek the Lord. You're going to give me the will of the Lord. You know what prophets do. You know, we're going to guide our way. We're going to hear the Lord's voice. And we're going to get God's voice. And we're going to hear what God has to say for the nation and for the nation and for Julius. And, <laughs> and, and, and so I, I began to start praying. And so I started praying uh, before December, uh, the whole of November, and then the whole of December going towards New Year. And I went into almost 30 days. I don't know if I lost any weight, but I, I, I gained. I know it sounds crazy. I look smaller, but I actually gained. I actually weigh 100 kilograms. I have no idea where that weight is. I think it's the glory, bro. <laughs> I'm supposed, I'm, I look thinner. I look smaller, right? But I'm much heavier. It's like God has made... You see, the Bible says the word of God is, is like fire, amen, and it's gold. So I think there's gold in my bones now because I'm getting heavier. But it's good. It's a good heaviness. You know what I mean? It's the weight of glory, amen. And the Lord said to me, The Lord said to me, uh, just seek me and I'm going to speak to you. And so I began to seek the Lord. I, I mean, I've seeked the Lord like, I, couldn't, I, can't, I can't tell you how much I seek the Lord. Now I woke up saying, God, you, you're speaking now? You're going to say something? I said nothing. Nothing. Day after day, 21 days later, nothing. And after like lots and lots of waiting, I really waited long. 
I mean, I was waiting so long. It was like the worst bus trip ever. No bus ever came. No train came. Everybody was on strike, literally, in the spirit. And then the Lord began to speak to me. And he said to me, the first thing he said to me, Andre, um, has my church heard wrong? And I said, well, you know, this is a good thing, Lord, but where's the word? He says, has my church heard wrong? So he, he gives me a, a question. He asks me something. And so I said, Lord, what do you mean? And then he says, well, go to the Internet and see what people are calling 2019. Now, let's, let's do that quickly. For a moment in time, have you ever gone on Facebook to see what everybody said 2019 would be? Some say it's the year of breakthrough. Some say it's the year of open doors. What have you heard? The year of love, the year of hope, the year of what have you heard? Everybody heard. Am I right? So it's like this church is so schizophrenic right now. Are you with me? That this church is believing this. This church is, what is it you? What did you guys hear? The year of the basket. Nah, you see? See, it's completely, it's like, it's the year of the basket. Well, actually, yeah, it looks like the year of the bakery. <laughs> and uh, everybody's got something else. And so I spent a whole year, a whole year, I spent a whole day praying to God and I said, God, what's going on here? Have we missed it? Have we missed it? Last year we knew it was something else. And so, you know, sword, the year of the sword and the year of the breakthrough. And now this year everybody's got something else. And then the Lord began to speak to me and he said to me, son, everybody's right. Now, at, now this, at this point as a prophet, it gets bad. Are you with me? God comes to you first and says to me, hey, is everybody, is everybody missing it? Is everybody in my church wrong? Because everybody's got to go and have a look and see what they're saying this year is. And then I go and I study it. I see, you're, it's right. I never saw it. Everybody's got something to say. They've got a basket here in this church. And what is your church saying? It's a year of open heavens on that side and the open basket on this side. <laughs> I'm so glad it's not the year of the bastard or something, but it, thank God. It's the year of the basket. It's better than the year of the bastard. Thank you, Jesus. But you know, we Afrikaans interpretation into that. What is the Afrikaans word for basket, by the way? Monkey? Oh, yo, yo. That's just even worse. It's the year of the monkey. And a guy comes out and he says, yo, 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 yo. It's the year of the friend. Come here, Mikey. And if you're in clicks, hey, Komutsu, if you're in clicks, and you say, hey, you're Mikey, hear me, Mikey, the guy's going to think he's calling you a monkey. <laughs> that actually happened, and only in South Africa. Do you guys you see that? It happened, yeah. Can you believe it? Clicks. Racial, racial fight. The woman asked for a Mikey. The other woman clapped her because she thought she was asking for a monkey. <laughs> only in South Africa can you have such a perversion of words. But anyway, the point is that God spoke to me and he said to me, Andre, they're all right. And I'm like, what do you mean they're all right? He says, son, because I want you to go and prophesy that there's one word I'm giving the earth in the next three years. One, it's going to be three years of this. And I said, okay, this is cool. This is cool. I'm hearing now. This is like, I'm hearing now. He says, this is going to be three years of I am. Three years of I am. I said, God, explain to me. He says, in the next three years in South Africa, I am going to be I am. I am whatever you need me to be, I am. And so everybody's right. For the first time, everybody's actually right. It's not confusion. The church is actually not in confusion. We're actually in the greatest unity of the spirit. We've never been so unified in our lives before, and we don't even know it, because God knew we could not be unified. We could not be unified by our ideas. We could not be unified by our own personal prophetic purposes, but we could be unified by I am. Only I am can come to 50 people who all have a different idea about who he is in this year, and then come in and say, you're all right, because I am your breakthrough. I am your basket. I am your flower. I am your 
open door. I am the way. I am the miracle. I am the supernatural. Whatever you want me to be, I am. I am. That's why Jehovah has more than one name. It's Jehovah Nessie, Jehovah Shama, Jehovah Sh- <laughs> Neske, uh, uh, you me, Rafa. He's, he's Jehovah. All these things because he knows that we have specific needs and each dimension has a specific need. Hallelujah. And so this is supernatural realm coming. Amen. And then the Lord said to me, in the next three years, I will, I will have to do something. And I really believe it. I believe it now. I believe it now, more than ever now, that something unique is happening. It's going to be a unique e- election. Because it's, it's going to do two things. Two things. Only two things it's going to do. It's either going to show us, the church, how messed up we really are. Or it's going to show us how great we are. And if... If we don't do the dent this year, this this year, it'll give it'll give it'll give the party that be another four years. Am I right? To show how messed up they really are, and that could actually be quite glorious. The chaos could be glorious. The mess could be glorious. There has to be some pain before a child can be born, eh? And maybe we remnant leftover South Africans, praise God. We, I, 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 I always do this. Where's Komutso? I need to say this again. You see, this is what I enjoy about Jesus. I did this in VidBank, and I'm going to do it here just for the fun of it. So one more time, you and your brother at the back there, I want to ask the question just for the fun. So how does it really, really, <laughs> really feel? Being a minority. Very bad. <laughs> Did you hear that? Did you hear that? I said, how does it feel being a minority? Very bad. He says, very bad. But well, that's how we whiteies feel. Okay, shop. <laughs> Can I tell your brothers how it feels? <laughs> Only two black brothers. Majority of you. Feel how we feel. When we walk into Soweto, how we feel. <laughs> Smile, enjoy it. We hear. That's it. So you might as well laugh at what we might as well laugh at it. Amen. Because it's gonna be glorious when God brings it through. Musi, what's his name? Musi Masimena Musi. Musi Mani Mani Say it. Because we whiteies, we know Pit van Veg. We don't know. Musi my money. Yeah, my money, I thought so. <laughs> Musi my money. Mr. Musi, my money, I think you must change your name, my boy. <laughs> Mr. Musi, my money. And the other guy that runs the DC, ACDC, ACDC. <laughs> it's not Avi a beer, I know that. Um, Kenneth Mishwe. Oh, these two guys. Uh, yeah. DA, you yeah, guys are weird. You want to kill children in the womb still? You're not so cool about... Uh, you know, uh, you know, homeschooling and that kind of stuff. Uh, you, you got problems, DA. Let's be real. You got problems. But we must pray for you. And we pray for Kenneth. I don't know about the EFF. I'm not too sure. I don't have a real strong pull to pray, you know, for them too much. But I do see, for the first time, a, a, a large light coming. Because if the DA do get somewhere, and the ACDP do get a little bit more votes. We might have a little bit of, let's say, a little bit of a push to start pushing some, some righteous things into the country. Are you with me? So there is hope. If we all vote right, A, you'll help the country. Now, I saw Musi preaching in Planet Shakers. How many saw that? Yeah, I saw Musi preaching in Planet Shakers. Can you believe it? Planet Shakers. And he's preaching in Australia, and he's preaching in Planet Shakers. And he's talking about giving. And he's talking about how we can actually save a whole nation. And I thought, I check that guy. He's going to be the president. Not now, but he's going to be the president. He's going to be the president of South Africa, whether we like it or not. That guy's going to be the president. Not now, but he's going to be the president. There must be a woman. She must come still. But he's going to be the president one day. He's still young. See, God's girding him up, very young. Training him up, very young. 
and he preaches, and he preaches a good word. Plant and shake is out of all the places in the world. That's a whole youth movement, man. We know it's going to happen. There's, so like, there's lights, there's lights boom, all over the place. Boom. And it's like, what the heavens is going on? It's like the giant is wakening up. I get a call to go to the president's office to meet with the, the, of the security of the country. That's really cool, isn't it? I get a phone call. Uh, like, like, like he gives me a phone call like four hours earlier. He says, hey, you're going to be in church, you know? So I get like a phone call from the office of the president. Hi, right, Prophet Andre. I said, yeah, it's a really good show. He says, um, you need to be in our offices now. I said, cool, the MC of the Minister of Military or some, some I don't even know who they are, these people. Who are they? That person, anyway. They call me in. So I go into Pretoria and the, there's just black cars everywhere because the president is having a meeting to discuss state stuff, whatever. And I mean, I go into this meeting and I get to minister to some of the top heads in the ANC in a private meeting. They all born again, spirit filled, tongue speaking, Holy Ghost filled men and women in the ANC. And I'm like, and I'm like, but don't you know that your party's like, he says, no, no, but God put us here. And then I realized, whoa, it's not really about the political party, is it? Whether it's the ACDP or the ANC, or, it's whether a man of God is in that position. That's the key. Because if we have that man of God in the ANC and that man of God in the DA and that man of God over here, and it comes to really, really raising the country, I'm sure the Bible will cut through. So God, in his method of madness, has put us everywhere. It's just they are so quiet right now because they've had to be quiet. How would they ever get to the ranks? How would they get to that level of takeover? Are you with me? How would they get to that level where they can influence the nation if they start professing Jesus now? So it's all hidden. I'm speaking to these Political leaders in the ANC who were born again, spiritual, tongue speaking, and I prophesy. I prophesy things, my friend, that shocked me. That those men were crying, those women were crying, and I can't mention all the names because there's a video here and I'll be in trouble. And already the security police are following me. That's why I have a security guard now. <laughs> and he's a nice big guy. So I travel with this now because things are getting hot. Amen. Praise God. Glory to Jesus. South Africa will be saved. Amen. <laughs> South Africa will be saved. And there's coming this incredible move of God that no demon can stop. No devil and no political party can stop. And yeah, there are going to be some fires and stuff. And that Lord showed me that. But it's only because of people who want to instigate. They want to instigate chaos. Like Julia's going to Cape Town now. Are you with me? And then trying to do a land grab. To coloreds, are you mad? Are you mad? You, you just, you're dumb. You don't do a land grab with coloreds. Coloreds, they will cut you up, boy. I try to do a land grab in, in, in Cape Town. And the coloreds got a hold of this. And every gang that was killing each other stopped killing each other. They say, hey. We Americans and you are yuckies and you are JFKs and we stop fighting this thing. Let's go fight these guys. That's what happened. Those gangsters got together. We're not gonna fight each other now. They put up their shacks. Twenty-four hours they got a rule. Twenty-four hours. You must watch, eh? It's very important that we, this nation knows the law. Twenty-four hours. So if you can see them twenty-four hours, within twenty-four hours you must break the shack. If it's there for longer than twenty-four hours, they can take that land, eh? Then you have to get a place for them to go. So just remember, we've got 24 hours. I hope we are warm rock, me, and wakker rock. Because Julius wants to do that. But it's fine. We can also pull down the shacks. They clap those shacks to stuck in <laughs> Except, is that right? Is that oh, bad English? Those colors, they took those shacks to pieces, my bro. So the mark like done lost them and broke that thing down. And the next morning, it was gone. Overnight, gone, gone. Then they try to come back again. Have you ever seen colors? 
<laughs> Listen, if there's going to be any type of thing, it's going to be that kind of confrontation. Are you with me? There's going to be pockets of it. Are you with me? And it will, it will not last long. It'll be quickly out. It'll be in and out. My friend was saying, yeah, the cops are shooting rubber bullets like they were, they were mad. And it was gone. And Julius flew off again. <laughs> in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So the Lord said to me this. He said, so I have a lot of hope for the country. I believe God's up to something. But that's not my message. My message is being prophetic tonight. So watch this. So he said, Andre, this is what's going to happen. And I'm going to say some things that are going to get me into trouble. He said, you gathered millions to pray. Millions to pray. Am I right? We did, didn't we? Papa Angus helped us. Amen. Um, we need a black leader to stand with Papa Angus. Desperately. A guy like Musa. Musa Sono is the guy that I'm praying for, that we connect big time with Ang Papa, Papa Angus. I'm trusting God for that. Unfortunately, the last time when Angus went to Soweto, it was, wasn't so cool. Yeah, 20,000. 20, because Soweto will follow the leaders, you understand? But it's going to happen. It's going to happen. We just have to pray harder now. We prayed, and we saw rain in Cape Town, which is cool. Amen? God did it for us. And we prayed in Pretoria, and turnout wasn't as great as Bloemfontein. But that's the reason. I mean, Pretoria, if you're with me, Bloemfontein was great. It's the center of the nation. And he told me, you've done all this. He said, you've done your bit. Now I'm going to do my bit. And this is what God said. He said this. I'm going to bring an act of God. A supernatural act of God is coming. An act of God is something that is so radical, it is without the means of man. An act of God could be dangerous as well, because it could be a, a fire an act of God could be an earthquake. An act of God could be a storm. An act of God could be a death of someone. An act of God could be something that is beyond man's ability. Moses was to carry an act of God into Egypt. Now, you, 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 if you read your Bible, you're going to see it's very unique, actually. It's not my message, but I want to show you what's going to happen. Um, and for the first time in my life, I feel like a weird prophet, but it's cool. <laughs> um, an act of God, an act of God is a sovereign time where God says, stand back, let me come forward. Now, I'm going to do something that no man can do. Because you've prayed, you can do that. Say amen. amen. You've worshipped, you can do that. Say amen. amen. You've fasted. Say amen. amen. That's all that you can do. But after you have done all you can do, and there's no change, then you need to know I'm coming. And God told me, I am, I am, has come. He's here right now. He's here right now in this nation. When Neville phoned me up at 1 o'clock in the morning saying to me, do you have a word? I said, I have a word, but I can't give it. I still have the word. It's in my car right now. It's almost 32 pages. That's, I've got 18 pages of it. I can't give it. It's too, it's too violent. Because it's an act of God. We are going to see things that God is going to do that is beyond even our mind. Our mind cannot articulate it. Our mind will not be able to understand it. We will think we're in Armageddon. But we have to stand back and let God be God. And he's going to do it. And when he sweeps through the nation, when he's left, holiness is going to prevail. God is going to prevail. And that ancient revival that has been prophesied to for years and years and years is suddenly going to just manifest. And we'll see it. We'll actually behold it. So now, while we're busy doing this, 
I'm going to do this. That was very deep and rare. That was very hard to do. And so the Lord said to me this. He said, that's about the longest I've stood for a long time. Give a little praise offering for that. Amen. And we're all good. So I said, we're going to have supernatural act of God. Say an act of God. Is not when God moves and does something that no human can do. Act of God is when there's a healing. An act of God is when blind eyes open. An act of God is when a president surrenders to Jesus. An act of God is when a president who's backslidden, who was Kenneth Meshu's, um, Kenneth Meshu's leader in university for the CU, Christian Union. Did you know that? Do you know that? Our president at the moment, our president Cyril, was the leader of a youth movement, Christian youth movement in university, and under him was Kenneth Mishu. Did you know that Kenneth Mishu submitted to him as a spiritual leader? Oh, and God is married to the backslider. And the Spirit of God is still there somewhere, even if it's just a dot. We just need a touch more. So we don't know what's going on yet, but something seriously is going on where political leaders, are you with me, are hiding their faith to get the power. What they do with that power will be determined by how much we pray. But an act of God is a supernatural impulse of God moving on your behalf. And we're going to start to see God moving supernatural acts of God in our lives. It's going to be insane because there's going to be nothing we're doing. We're going to supernaturally get careers. I mean, I'm getting guys that are Afrikaners getting tenders right now. It's insane. And it's like one guy just got a wooden a tender. That's ridiculous. I asked him, how did you get the tender? He says, I have no idea. I said, but you're the wrong color. You're the wrong color of skin. Don't worry. Uh, Komutsu is okay with this. He understands that. Are you with me? That some of us are sprayed the wrong way. It doesn't matter. <laughs> But the bottom line is, these guys are getting tenders, getting called back into projects that stopped seven years ago, eight years ago. Isn't that amazing? Something's up, man. There's an act of God, a supernatural act of God. Those that have faith in the season are going to start to see God because you've run out of ideas, haven't you? You've run out of ideas. You've run out of concepts. You can't pray anymore. You can't fast anymore. You can't tithe anymore. You're tithing as best you can. You can't give anymore. You're giving everything. Now... God is coming. I prophesy this and you're going to see it. Because after 400, it's okay, just throw things there. Just throw things. Vit Bank is used to throwing stuff. Listen, our condition is 20 years old. 24 years old. Is it 23 years old? How old is it? 20 what? 20 years. 20, 20 something, whatever. We don't even know how much we've been in bondage. How long have we been in bondage for? 25 years. Our condition is 25 years. Israel's was 430 years. Israel's condition was 430 years where they were enslaved by a wrong government called Pharaoh. And when the cry of the Egyptian, when the cry of the Hebrews became so loud, God decided to get someone in the government. Ah, you better get a revelation. God decided to get someone in the government of the day and bring him out so he could change the nation. Did you get it? Moses was a prince in the camp of Pharaoh. Otherwise, he was in the political party of Pharaoh. Is that deep? Then God allowed him to catch a wake up in that political power when he was on the height of his power. Delivered him, brought him to a burning bush experience, and then began to speak to him about going back into politics. But the politics he would go back into now would not be the politics he was trained in because it would be a politics of God moving. So when he goes back, he goes back to become a political leader. Oh, you're not getting a revelation. To dethrone a government. To drown a government. Did you not see that? <laughs> From within, they are already eating themselves. Because God is in it. And we saw it. Even with Julius, God was in that thing as well. All of it is God moving. He's moving. And we can't see his prayers are actually being answered. Our prayers are being answered. 
if Julius was not removed to start his own party, the other party would have been too strong now. It would never, ever break or crack anyway. Don't you get it? Because God wants to bring a South African government in place. He brought out others to divide the very South. They can't stop it. There's nothing they can stop. And there's coming more division. There's more breaks coming now. More are going to leave. Watch. Because you and I are praying. And God is bringing an act of God to us. A supernatural act of God. So that parliament can be opened with prophets. Parliament can be opened, amen, with prayer again. And this nation can turn away from the abomination, amen. And we can start to see God ruling in our streets again. It's going to happen. Righteousness always wins. I read the book. So an act of God is coming, Matthias. An act of God is coming. It is a sovereign, supernatural act of God that no man can say, I did it. No man is going to stand up and say, our prayer meeting made this thing happen. Because we will all be stuck, we're struck with dumbness. Are you with me? And we will be shocked to see how God did it. And it's going to be such a twist. It's going to be like one of those movies you're watching. Where you think you know what's going to happen at the end. And then it just, at the end, it just twists. And it's like, what the heavens? I never saw that coming. South Africa is going to turn around and say, I never saw that coming. We didn't see it coming. Not like that. And watch it's coming. It's going to rain in this nation. Because the whole of Africa's revival is determined by what happens in the Western Cape. It's determined by the fire that is lit in the Cape province that will begin to blow itself all the way through the rest of the continent. That thing has been delayed for how long? We've heard the first prophecies in 78, 79, in the 80s. Bill Hammond in 88 prophesied it. You know how many years ago that is? Amen. How many prophecies have we received that from the Cape, from the point of Africa, from the tip of Africa, would come forth a revival? Do you think all those prophets are wrong? Do you think Cindy Jacobs is wrong? Do you think all the prophets that ever prophesied these things is wrong? They're not wrong because God cannot lie. We've been repeating it over and over and over and over and over that the greatest revival the world has ever seen is on our doorstep. It might not see it in this election, but we're going to see it soon. America just saw it. I mean, America never thought that a godly man would stand up. You know, Prophet Jeff is a friend of mine in the States. He was called in with 300 prophets secretly to Donald Trump. Donald Trump just surrounded himself with 300 prophets of America. He said, you, you hold my back now. Oh, there's a war going on. There's a war going on. Are you with me? People are going mad. Are you with me? Democrats are going crazy. They want abortion. They want to kill children. Are you with me? And Donald's standing up and saying, no, we don't want to do that anymore. Something's happening in the earth. Sheep nation, goat nations. There's a war going on in the spirit. And we're going to trust God that Israel, amen, will find peace with South Africa. Amen. And that this nation will turn its heart back to Israel. Things are going to change. It's a radical shift. And so I said, okay, God, good. We're going to have an act of God. Very cool. Love it. It's great. How many people love it? Amen. Love it. I said, okay, Lord, now, now show me how it's going to work. He says, okay, cool. Um, he, he began to speak to me. Then he reminded me of a prophecy that I spoke about California in uh, September. September, October? September, I said, California, you will burn. Oh, California, my prophecy goes. Oh, California, you shall burn. Because your senators want this, and your senators are fighting Donald, and you want this and this and this, and therefore you shall burn. And Rachizva, it happens. It really happens. Not even 30 days after the prophecy or 35 days. I can't even remember. I must let you look. You should be recording everything. Because I'm not, not this stuff. The stuff that I prophesied. Because I'm a madman. I say things that come to pass. I don't even know what I'm saying. And it starts burning. California starts burning. They call it the wild bush fire. So you with me. And no one can put it out. It just sweeps out. And then the Lord says, okay, now you see, that was an act of God. It wasn't nice. People died. Are you with me? But it was an act of God. It was a sovereign, supernatural act of God that we and I and religion is not going to like. Because the time of judgment, prophets are coming. Whether we like it or not. 
because God's going to bring his nations back. Are you with me? And Israel always had judges. Then they asked for prophets. But when they got prophets, those prophets judged. They judged on the Mount of Carmel, and they judged Jezebel. They even mentioned how she would die. Now, that's pretty deep. And, of course, in the school of Bill Hammond and other prophets, we prophesy and we declare that there's no judgment prophets. But there are judgment prophets, and they're coming. Amen. They're real, and they're coming, and they're necessary to shift and to shape a whole nation. Are you with me? Whole nation is going to be changed. I don't know why they, they, they're not there, because they, maybe they're scared. But somebody needs to take a crooked finger and point it in somebody's ear and say, Hey, you know what? You're in judgment of God, because you cannot say that you're more powerful than Jesus. And we know what happened to the Beatles. Smile at me, man. I know you like the Beatles. But when the Beatles said, oh, we are more famous than Jesus, was it was, what, even a year later, they were, boof, gone. They disappeared. They're no longer famous. They're gone. Gone. Where are they? Gone. Does judgment come quickly like that? The moment. So Julius must just keep on being an idiot. I continue being an idiot and mention the name of Jesus and, and defile the name of Jesus because we, yeah, I'm not afraid of him. He should be afraid of me because I serve a living God. He doesn't. And we don't fear these men. How can you fear someone that has the power to put you in hell? Are you with me? <laughs> so, so the Lord is going to move. Amen. And God's going to bring some aggression. Aggressive prophets are going to speak the word of God and the truth. Um, the other day we were driving, me and Chomotsu were driving, a cop stopped us. Pretty cool. I mean, a cop stopped us. I said to Chomotsu, hey, I've got no time for this. I came back from a meeting. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm tired. I want to go home. So I said, Chomotsu, watch this. So the cop came. I looked at the cop and I said, uh, why are you stopping us? And he says, no, no, it's a random check. Where are you coming from? I said, sir. Spirit of God hit the cop. Ask him. Spirit of God hit the cop. What happened? He started speaking in tongues. Same cop. Same cop looking for. Started speaking in tongues. God's spirit is too powerful, man. He started speaking back. And then he stopped and said, What's going on here? I said, Wait. <laughs> Do you think God's limited to whether you have a uniform and a badge on? Nah, you can wear as much red socks and red caps as you want. You don't have nothing near the blood of Jesus, man. And so God started speaking in tongues. Doesn't even go to church. I know he doesn't go to church. Not saved. He stopped. He said, what's going on? I said, well, I don't want to be harassed. So he said, who are you? I said, I'm a prophet. He said, a prophet. What's that? I said, oh, the prophet, you know? So he's like, Shepherd Bishiri. I said, no, Shepherd Bishiri's not a prophet. He's not a prophet. He thinks he's a prophet. Yeah. He's not a prophet. If he's a prophet, he can sell all, everything he's got. Give it to the poor. Start again. Um, so I said, sir, uh, this is a situation. So I can prove to you that there's prophets. So you want to come tell them? It's fun. You can. I said, uh, you're having an affair. You're married. You're married for how many years? I gave him the amount of years. You're married for so many years. You've got so many children. Um, this is the woman you, 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 you married. But you have an affair with this woman. This is the woman. This is her medical condition. This is the condition, the medical condition of the woman that you're having an affair with. She has this problem. And I've been to explain the problem and everything. And I said, this is where you live. This is what's going on. And this is what's happening at the moment in your life. Blah, 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 blah. And I said, I can give you mercy right now. And I can forgive you for your trespasses against your wife. And you can go home to your wife. And she will love you like you've never been loved before. And I can make the girl that you're having an affair with disappear so that she'll never irritate you again. Would you like God to save your marriage? He starts weeping just about. And he says, yes. Hey, we pray for him right there. <laughs> we pray for him right there. I know you guys have this all the time. This is like normal for you guys to stop cops. And, and the power of God is on him. And I, don't, I think he was dazed by the power of God. And he puts his head in. We pray for him, everything. He says, go, go, go. Pretty cool, eh? Well, the next day I realized that my, my driver's license had expired. No, I'm serious, guys. This is the truth. My driver's license, the card, had, is, it had expired. And I didn't know it. 
And then we looked at the windscreen. Can you remember? And that also had expired. <laughs> so we had a drive. We didn't know. Driver's license had expired. The car had expired. Everything was expired. But Kina Mashaka Babatorze Besentre had not expired. Amen. Acts of God. Supernatural acts of God. Amen are going to begin to manifest. And we're going to start to see God. Mardu, lift your hand to heaven. We're going to start to see God. Marani Setra Mantra move in our lives in a supernatural way. Because our method of doing it, we've run out. God, We've run out of methods of how to build the church. Methods how to fill up a house. <laughs> we've run out of ideas, Father God. So now let God be God. In this saprande. Come, God, give a supernatural act of God in our finances. Somebody say amen. amen. Give a supernatural act of God in our marriages. Somebody say amen. amen. Give a supernatural act of God in our education of our children. Amen. Yeah. Give a supernatural act of God. Come, let it come. Let it come, Lord. We accept it, Lord. Even though it might be that the, that the fish die in the Nile or flies come or whatever, Lord. Let it be, Lord. Whatever it is, let it be in Jesus' name. Now, listen to this. So, you can take your hands down now. It's fine. You kind of grabbed it now. You've got it. So, um, it gets down to New Year's. And uh, the Lord says, now, I'm going to show you an act of God. I said, hey, yes, it's cool. I'm going to see an act of God. Cool. So, he says to me, this is now on a hot day. It's a hot day. It's a day before New Year's in Johannesburg. I'm in Johannesburg. I think I'm in Johannesburg. I'm in Johannesburg, yeah. And he says, now, I want you to go outside. And the Lord says to me, do you know I can stop people from drinking and parting? I said, God, what are you talking about? He says, I'm going to show you an act of God because I want you to believe me that there are acts of God coming. I said, okay, cool. He says, I will stop people from drinking tomorrow. I said, but God, <laughs> it's New Year's. Everybody can drink. Are you with me? Yo, it's a nice day until 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. Here by 7 o'clock, clouds start coming into Johannesburg. How many of you were in Johannesburg during New Year's? You know what I'm talking about. I mean, it's heavy, heavy clouds start peeling over. I'm watching this thing, man, unfolding. You're at 11 o'clock, one hour before New Year's. It gets like a storm in Johannesburg. Ask him what's all. I mean, it's hectic. It's windy. It's like Cape Town wind. It's storming. There's lightning. The rain is coming down. It's like buckets of rain coming down. <laughs> yeah, 11.59. There is no people shouting. No one's outside in the street. And no one's drinking with open air parties. Because there's no open air parties. Everybody's stuck in their homes. No one's driving around because it's been storming. And I hear God saying, an act of God. And I'm convinced. That God, you can do this thing. You can actually do. Are you inspired? You can actually do this thing, God. You can actually stop everybody from celebrating outside because it's raining. And no one celebrated. And then the Lord said to me the second thing. He said to me, after that, now I'm praying. Now I'm really praying. And now I feel like a prophet. Are you with me? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Lord said to me this. He said, okay, now, Andre, I want you to understand. The, you must go back and tell the body something. I said, okay, cool. I got this whole, I, I am. It's cool. I've written that down. I am is coming in. I understand that. And everybody's right. That's good, that's good prophecies. Isn't it good prophecies for the nation, isn't it? I mean, it's good prophetic words. An act of God is coming where God can sovereignly move in our lives. And we've seen, how many of you have seen some acts of God yet this year? Wave your hands. Oh, you should get me in the beginning of the year. It's much easier than you can get before. You know, it's, but it's okay. And uh, we've seen some acts of God, supernatural God moving. Some of you have seen it, but you haven't manifested it yet. And then the Lord said to me this. He said, now I'm going to show you something. Bear with me. I'm going to show you something. Because I'm not going to just give you prophecy like I used to. I'm going to let you feel it, see it, experience it. Otherwise, you're not just going to get prophecy. You're going to... You're going you're gonna to sense it all around you. I woke up that morning, yo, sick. Next morning I woke up sick. I just come back from Kenya, having revival in Kenya. Now I think I've got malaria. Brew. 
those demon mosquitoes. <laughs> I'm sweating, man. So I'm scared now. So I find a doctor to go to at 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. They check me out. No, I don't have malaria. I'm fine because, I mean, I'm, I'm hot. But I, they say I, I, they're going to monitor me. And I, they don't think I've got it, whatever. I, I, but I'm hot. I'm sweating. Listen to me. It, it comes to uh, 6 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the evening. I'm sweating so much that, that I'm on 39 degrees at the moment. I'm sweating 39 degrees. I'm illus- del- delusional. I'm delusional. I call my mom. Yo, I love my mom. I call my mom. I say, Mom, she was with me in, during that time. I said, come, come here. She was visiting my daughter. We were all visiting my daughter in, in, in my you know, year. And I said, Mom, you must, you must pray for me. This Portuguese woman must pray. She put towels on me, wet on towels on me. We made a Portuguese soup. Yo, we did everything. We prayed, we prayed, we prayed. And the Lord said to me, keep praying. I'm going to show you something. We pray, 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 we pray. And the Lord says, okay, now you've prayed enough. You've seen your miracle. I hear it. I hear it. Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. Seven, eight, nine. Three hours later, boo, I get out of bed. No fever, all gone. I said, God, what is this? He said to me, son, I'm going to show you the prophecy. But I'm not going to show it to you in words from a prophet. I'm going to show you the things happening around you. Some of you must be very careful because God has been speaking to you. with things that are happening around you. But you're not seeing it. God is speaking to us in a different form. Yo. I'm going to say that again. God is speaking to us in a different form. He's come to us in a different form. And because we are thinking we're being attacked, we're not seeing actually the voice in it. Listen, because a woman has pain when she brings a child, doesn't mean the pain is an attack from Satan. The pain is actually God's miracle starting. It tells the woman it's time to push. If she didn't feel the pain, she wouldn't know when to push. And that baby wouldn't live. Are you getting a revelation here? Some of the pains we've experienced is actually prophecy unfolding. And God is trying to say things. Every sign is pointing to something. It's crazy time. It's like he's not just speaking to us here in the spirit or in the word. He's speaking to us through our lives as well. So now I'm healed perfectly. Nine o'clock, I'm healed, man. I'm healed. And I said, Lord, what is this word? He says, tomorrow I will, I hear it, I hear it. He says to me, tomorrow I will show you the word manifested. You will understand tomorrow. One o'clock the next day, I get a phone call from one of my prophets. She's crying. She's saying, please, can you help me? She's in Namibia. I say, what's the problem? Listen to this. She says, my daughter has contracted a fever. I just had the fever. I just prayed from 4 o'clock, are you with me, till 9 o'clock to get rid of the fever in my own body. That was the prophecy. The next day at 1 o'clock, this woman phones me. She's a minister. She's in Namibia. She says, we're desperate. My husband, we don't know what to do. There's no doctors around. It's a holiday. There's no doctors around. The doctor's baby's been sick for three days, but the fever's got so bad now, it looks like she's about to have a convulsion. We've, we, we're asking you, prophet, can you please pray? We need you, prophet, to pray because there's no doctors. We can't go anywhere. We, we're in the middle of nowhere. I called my mom. I said, Mom, come. This is the reason why I had to face what I faced yesterday because I studied the Bible from 4 o'clock till, till that time I was healed on the word fever, how God brings a fever and how the people in the Bible were healed from fevers. I studied it. I got healing into my bones. We got on our knees and we prayed for that little baby. I said, God gave it to me three, year, three, three hours. I told the lady, three hours time, your fever will leave your child. You know, you have to boldness to do that. Amen. At four o'clock, she phoned me. She said, thank you, prophet. My baby's running around eating. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Soup natural acts of God are going to start to take place and then I ask myself the question what have we experienced in our lives because whatever we've experienced in our life was not to destroy us it was to heal someone 
I wasn't supposed to have the fever. I was supposed to get the victory in that pain. Then I'm looking at the body and I'm thinking, what on earth have you gone through in the last season of your life? In the last seven years or ten years of your life, what trauma have you experienced so that you can give somebody else their miracle? And then it starts happening to all of the prophets around me that are working with me. They all go through the same thing. One gets the sickness over here. One gets the pain over here. One gets this thing over here. They start to pray. Then they get healed. And then the next time, the next couple of days, they meet people. They've got those problems and they're getting healed like this instantly. And I'm realizing, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We, we, we're missing it. We're missing it. We were not supposed to get sick. We were supposed to learn how to get healed so that we can heal others. And so these supernatural acts of God start taking place. Like crazy stuff start happening. It's quite a cool evening. I think it's a cool evening. Are you enjoying this evening? It's like supernatural things are happening, man. It's insane. So the Lord, like, take me on this whole journey. And then I get this jaw thing happen. Then I get this thing that happens. Now I can pray for people. They've got problems in their mouths. Yeah. But anyway, besides all this, it's getting a bit of rush. So I actually knew I was going to be here. <laughs> but I was fighting it. And I, I made an excuse because when your secretary said, you know, what do I want to do? The Spirit of God said to me, no, go there Saturday and then enjoy the meeting because I'm going to be there. And then sleep over there. And I knew it was God. And I bargained. I said, yeah, but I could just rather just sleep at home, with my, you know, spend some time with my daughter and everything. So when he did phone me, I realized, ah, he wins again. <laughs> he wins again. But, but what really got to me is, what really got to me was is after I said, I said, let me go pray. It was like five minutes, eh? In that five minutes, I probably had about an hour vision in five minutes. So tomorrow is going to be very unique. And tonight is even more unique. I also knew in my spirit the place wouldn't be full. Because sometimes we just gather people who are like lice. <laughs> They're really not part of the body. They, they just... Irritating the body. I'm serious. Not everybody's a part of the body. Some people are like lice. They just, they're on the body, but they're irritating the body. They're just biting and sucking the body dry. You know what I'm saying? And so something unique happened. It's like really, very cool. Can I share it with you? Not all of it, but this, this little piece. It's very, very cool. It's very cool. So the Lord been speaking to me, and I was in Vitbank and in other places, and the Lord is speaking to me a lot about the crossing, the crossing, about the Jordan, the crossing. And I, and I shared some, how much time do I have, by the way, because I can stop any time. Um, just, if you guys want to have, grab a cup of coffee, go ahead, you know, phone for takeaways. It's not, I, don't have, I'm not, I don't have a problem with eating pizza. And, uh, um, but this crossing is important to me. It's so, it's so important. Just, just bear with me because I'm not going to share it tomorrow and tomorrow evening. I've got some other stuff. But I, I, I would never get to share this because this, this would have mean I had to have a third meeting. <laughs> I'm seeing things we have never seen before. Komutsu can bear witness with me. Am I right, sir? I'm seeing things that I've never seen before in my entire life. Something shifted. Something radical has shifted. But before you can have a great awakening, you have to have a shifting and you have to have a sifting. You can't have greatness without a shifting and a sifting. God has to sift us, man. So if, if, you, if you find yourself in a remnant of people, relax. It's the best thing that's ever happened to you. Because the, the mosquitoes, and the, are you with me? They like the body. They're not here. 
But what's coming is, is something I've never seen before. Uh, and I don't like to boast about miracles because I know I can't do a miracle. But I boast in one thing, and that's my suffering. But I want to tell you something glorious. We're in, we're in uh, Kenya. We're in Kenya. Share those miracles. We're in Kenya. And uh, in Kenya, I... I have a heart for I have a heart for um, the girls in 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 South Sudan. They're like 11 years old, 12, 13. They get sold for uh, um, uh, um, Aurora Aurora goats. Those big, I don't know what you call them. There's this, if you're a farmer, you know what I'm talking about. Those big goats they have in South Sudan with the big horns. Now two or three goats, and you can get yourself a, a bride. And there's like 65 year old guys that are buying these young kids. Are you with me to be wives. And they buy three or four for them. And, and that's child racketing. That's, that's, that's child. It's, it's wrong. Are you with me? And I, we can't have that. And I really want to affect that, that, that area. So we get to a, a, a couple of things happen. Um, I can't tell you all the stuff. I, so we go to a Pacific restaurant where the Lord tells me to go to with my team. Kamutsu's with me and Prophet Pastor Ken's with me. And... Um, and there's a lady sitting with a troop of people. The Lord says, me, go speak to her. And I go speak to her and I begin to prophesy into her life. I don't know her from a borrower, so I prophesy into her. Land up that she's actually a supermodel from Europe. Isn't that amazing? I didn't know it. I just thought she was tall. But <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, no, when, you, you, when you're that drunk in the spirit, you don't really see anything. Trust me. You just say, the Lord just says, go. And um, she's like a supermodel from South. She's a supermodel from Europe. Um, okay, she's tall, but I didn't know she was that tall because she was sitting. Only when she stands. And um, after I prophesied to her and everything, she works with, with girls in South Sudan to get them into Europe, into modeling agencies, legitimate modeling agencies, so they can go and study and be educated and get out of that thing so they don't become these, um, these, these young wives. And so now my heart is so, so blessed. Because I know the Lord, amen, is helping me to do this thing. Because this is my heart. And I, want to, I don't want to go where everybody else wants to go. I want to go where no one wants to go. You understand? And uh, so I connect with her. And we connect. And I make a couple of phone calls. And like in one hour, I'm connecting so many pieces together. It's unbelievable. You know? And then I'm driving with my team to a place in Karin. It's called Karin in Kenya. I know this is like, you guys have these things happen all the time. If you don't believe it, come with me on a trip. Have a look and see what happens. It's amazing. And I stop the car in the middle of a road. And now my, my guys know when I stop and do something, what do you do? You follow. You, you just, something's going to happen. Stop the road in the middle of nowhere. I'm, not, I'm in the middle of nowhere, man. In the middle of nowhere. Acts of God. Supernatural acts of God. In the middle of nowhere. And uh, the Lord says, stand in that corner. Now, I, I, I'm not into prostitution. Are you with me? So I, I'm... <laughs> But the Lord says, go stand on that corner. So I go stand on that corner, and I'm standing there. And then these guys think I'm crazy because now, you know, why are you standing on the corner? So Kamotsu asked me, I said, no, the Lord said to me, stand, so I'm going to stand here. So then he said, well, if you, God said you must stand here, I'm not going to miss it. I'm standing here. So Ken comes, and he's standing with me. And uh, what's his other name? Also, is what Kevin's also there, and we're all standing there, and they don't know what's going on. I'm just like, like an idiot standing there, like a real idiot. I mean, just standing. How long? 30 minutes? 45? 45. Imagine 45 minutes, you're standing on the corner of a road, bro, doing nothing. A white guy in Kenya. <laughs> Everybody's walking past, and I'm saying hello. I mean, I'm just saying hello. <laughs> People are saying hello back, school. cool. And then after 45 minutes, a man walks past, and the Lord says to me, take your finger. I know it sounds bad, eh? Take your finger. You know? Take your finger and put it over here in his leg. Yeah, in his leg. Was it this leg? You, you, know, you know the story better than I do because you were there. Uh, I was drunk in the spirit. Bro. 45 minutes in the spirit is a long time, eh? Um, and I put my finger in. He's a big guy. He's a big guy. He's a big. Show them how big he was. I mean, you're big. You're big. Stand up. If he's standing next to you, he's about. Yeah, he's, he's that tall. But now yeah, you're quite big. So just start, stand next to him so they can see. So yeah. So you, you, but you're also a big guy. So get the smallest guy in the church. No, joke. So I go and I put my finger in the guy's leg. And I look up at him and I say, Jesus, Jesus Christ is healing you. 
And I'm asking God, God, are you insane? You're going to get me killed in Kenya. <laughs> Put my finger in the guy's leg. And said, and look at this complete, oh, am I right? What's wrong with me? Why don't you stop me? What kind of protection are you? <laughs> you know why I need him now? I'm going to get clapped, man. I'm doing stuff now that I don't even trust myself. I need security, man. So I put my finger in it. You know, I'm saying, God, Jesus heals you. So Jesus Christ is healing you. He's healed you. And he's looking at me and says to me, who, what are you? What are you doing? So I said, now the Lord says he's healing you. I've got my finger in his leg, bro. He says, yeah, but I'm a Muslim. He's a Muslim. He says, I'm a Muslim. I don't believe in your Jesus. He told me straight. I said, I'm sorry, but now <laughs> nah, I'm scared. Nah, he's a Muslim, you know, Muslims. <laughs> I said, Naba Isa, that's Jesus, Prof, Naba, Prophet Isa, Jesus, which is in the Quran, by the way. He's the only prophet in the Quran. Did you know that? That's coming back. Did you know that, guys? The Quran actually says that Prophet Naba Isa shall return. <laughs> it doesn't say Muhammad's returning, it says Naba Isa's returning. Isn't that glorious? So anyway, Naba Isa, yeah. So um, he says, no, I'm Muslim. I don't believe in you, Jesus. Take my hand off his leg. He starts feeding his leg. He says, what did you do? Literally, that's what he's saying. What did you do? I said, what do you mean? He says, no, the spot where you put your finger is where the bullet went into my leg. The exact same spot. When he felt that, the bullet was no longer there. Uh, are you there? Did I pay you to say, this? wave your hand, were you there? Were you there? You were there. You're not a ghost. I have witnesses. When I put my finger in his leg, it was an exact same spot where the bullet went into his leg. When I took my finger out, the bullet was gone. It was lodged in his leg. They couldn't move it because otherwise he would lose his leg. And he had continual pain in his leg. Now, the bullet was gone. I asked him, where did you get it? The bullet from? Because now it's gone. He it says, in the war. It says, the war. I'm like, ah, I'm cool. So then I asked him a stupid question. What was the question? Who are you? Come on, come here. Let's have some fun. So who was he? He's a, he's a general in the army. In, in Sudan. In South Sudan. He's the right general to the president of South Sudan. Not even two hours early on, I was prophesying to that lady about South Sudan. I had prayed and said, Lord, I need to get into South Sudan. God knows why I must be there. Huh? Two hours later... I'm putting my finger in a man's leg only to find out he's supernaturally healed by the power of Jesus who happens to be the right general to the president of South Sudan in charge of the president of South Sudan's security. Hello. Whose daughter is the? Uh, Minister of Home Affairs. To who? To the president in South Sudan. In Kenya. Otherwise, she is the ambassador of South Sudan to Kenya. In one shot, I touched the general and I touched the, the embassy of South Sudan in Kenya. And after that, the same gentleman said, if you ever come to South Sudan... I will come and personally give you a military convoy wherever you want to go. His name is Jesus. Thank you. Come on, you can do better than that. Give Jesus a praise offering. I have never in my life, I've heard about it. We've read stories about it, but I've never seen it. I've never seen it manifested. Are you with me? But now we're starting to see things manifest that we've never seen before. Amen. This is a peculiar generation. We mustn't miss this moment. Don't have a normal meeting tonight. 
Because right here, God is dropping down something that is unique. And it's different places that God's going to drop it down. And we're going to, it's not going to be the places in the big cities, trust me. You're not going to see these things in the big cities. You won't. There's too much noise there. So now I'm thinking, no, this is crazy. So I get an invitation to the ministry. I think it's crazy. You think it's crazy? You think it's crazy? Um, it gets even worse. Now they hear about me. I, I had an invitation to, what's his name? Bishop what? BKKP what? JP Masenga. I don't know who the guy is. He's a bishop. Bishop's a bishop. I play chess. I'm more into the queen, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, <laughs> but the bottom line is, you know, this bishop calls me to minister in his church. Now, I don't know what's wrong with me. I must be a prophet sometimes. I cancel the man. I say, no, I can't come. God told me I can't come. I cancel on this bishop. Can you believe it? I cancel on him. Well, that's cool. And I'm going now to another church. Are you with me? So I get to that church and I prophesy to this man and about him connecting with a certain man, only to find out that the man that he's connecting to is actually his father. His father is the bishop that invited me. <laughs> Long story short, when I landed back in Nairobi, the, the bishop was so impressed with the prophecy, he drove to me in his own car. Now, the bishops don't do that in Kenya, right? They have a convoy before, and you have a special meeting. But I'm the prophet that said no. It's amazing what happens, teenagers, when you say no. <laughs> There'll be a lesson. Amen. And he drove, picked me up in his car, took me to his office, spoke with me. He said, you're a prophet. That's pretty cool. I mean, I don't need him to tell me I'm a prophet, but that's cool. I'm a prophet. That's cool. Thank you so much. I agree with you. And, and then, then he gives me his whole office comes. He calls all these pastors come. I'm thinking now he's got a small church. I walk in. What the heavens? The guy is a bishop of over 1,800 churches all over the world. I turned the guy down. <laughs> now Listen. I hope you're having fun, but just be real. That's like having an opportunity to do business with like the Akamayans. Akamai or something. You know what I'm saying? And you turn him down and then only realize afterwards, yeah, the talk, that's the richest guy. Yeah. All right. So anyway, after I prophesied to all these people and everything, and he's like totally shocked and everything, he sits me down, he says to me this, this is what he says to me. He says to me, Now, you have access, Prophet Andre to all of my churches throughout the world, 1,800 churches, you have access to any of them. Anytime you want to go to anyone, you pick up the phone, you can go. Is that insane? Yeah, it is insane. Acts of God, supernatural acts of God. And then he tells, is it Kumusa? Did he tell you? Where were you sitting? Come, come here. <laughs> where were you? We were in his office, okay? So where were you sitting? Um, the... I was sitting on the couch where he said to me, this is where the president of Kenya said when he came to see him. So the president of Kenya, he's actually the pastor of the president of Kenya. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay. You guys have it all the time. So now I have direct access to the president of Kenya. No, you don't believe me. I have direct access to the president of Kenya. The Lord is graceful. Amen. Direct access to the president of Kenya. Amen. The Lord is good. The Lord is setting us up for nations. Amen. He's setting us up. And we know we can't do business without. Amen. We need to know the nations. Amen. So God is doing something very, very unique. And it's a, it's a, it's a unique season. Amen. So much I have to share with you. But I have to share this now. Do I have to turn up time? What time do you want to get the people home? No, no, just, just, this is like Acts 29. Are you with me? Like we, we, the extra chapters in the Bible that haven't been written yet. The things that were never told. Remember Jesus said, all these things that have never been told. And if I told you about the things, there's too many books. Dream about it. Dream. Because all you need to do is dream. You just need to believe God that something's going to happen in your life. I never thought I would ever get there. But you're going to see supernatural miracles. You're going to have supernatural contracts coming out of nowhere. 
A BEE company I know, a BEE company I know, that failed the BE rating, failed the BE rating, gets called in by one of the largest mining concerns. Listen to this. Listen to this. To do a specialized job that they know only they can do, only to find out that this brother, this Afrikaans brother, his engineering company was actually doing the work for a BEEE company that was actually putting on over 300% profit on top of his work. That major mind concern says, we don't care about BEEE. We are going to give you all the work. And tells the other guy, go away because you've over, you over-exaggerated the margins. Illegal practice. Hello. Who ever thought that would happen in South Africa? And now it's not happening once. It's happening all over the time. One of my friends who was a top engineer who was, they, they got rid of him. They called him in. They said, come back here. We need you to take over this plant, which is, a, which is um, sun electricity. Take it over and run it. They gave him a three-month contract. Yo, we prayed. That three-month three month contract has become a three-year contract. His name is Jesus. Don't you ever think that God cannot move. If you can take a piece of lead out of a man's foot, he can open up contracts for us like you've never seen before. You've not seen nothing yet. Watch your God move on your behalf. Watch your God move on your behalf. It's supernatural. It's sovereign. Amen. So this thing I wanted to talk to you about, it's like the biggest thing ever, like in the history. And the last time I spoke to you about it, I didn't have all the pieces. Remember I spoke about the Joshua generation thing? Can you remember? Anybody remember this? How many people remember? Wave your hands. But I, what, I didn't, what I didn't see was, I can't really jump. There's no stairs here. So come help me. <laughs> Superman. Just. Huh. That wasn't too bad. So what I didn't understand was, actually, this thing's bigger than us. Because what this thing actually means is it's insane. Just in a nutshell, okay, then we can go home. No, we can't go home. Then I can release whatever needs to go home, and then I can pray for whoever needs to be prayed for. Because the prophets here, we can work. Why not? What's the worst thing that can happen? <laughs> but this thing is so big. I know I'm sounding like a deranged, weird guy, but it's not my fault. It's not like I have tattoos on my arms. <laughs> Tonight, today, I, 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 I put my head down, prayed, and then, you know, in this, it's like it's in the spirit. You see so much, and I saw so much. And the Lord said to me, specifically, just do this and do this and do this and do this. And he put it all together for me, and it's like crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's, it's crazy. I never thought I would live this long to actually see the beginning of it. And now I realize we're in the beginning of it. This is like the beginning of the greatest move the world will ever know. It's we here. And it's not tribulation, trust me. It's a glorious moment in the, in the history of the earth. And we actually here. We're on its doorstep. It's like we're the first to see it. But I need to understand some things. And, and so it all starts with the generation that thought they had it. You know, the generation that thought they had it. It's like it's like in that I'm just going to speak to you because I know it's a, it's a long moment in, in our time. But, you know, when Israel came out of Egyptian bondage, just listen to the process quickly. When they came out of Egyptian bondage, they came out of Egyptian bondage by an act of God. I mean, there's no way they could have been set free. They had an act of God. There had to be an act of God. And the act of God can set the captive free, right? So there had to be an act of God for every guy that was on drugs. An act of God for every guy that was a drug dealer. I won't mention names, yeah? And uh, <laughs> but there had to be an act of God. Are you with me? And that act of God then brings you out and you go on like a, a little journey and you go up. You go up onto Mount Sinai and you have this experience with God where he takes his finger. It's pretty cool. He takes his own finger and he, he actually cuts. He cuts two tablets with his own hands. God, God. Cuts the two tablets with his own hands. Then with his own finger, he writes down ten laws. 
his own finger. You know that he did it with his own finger. Then Moses comes down. He breaks it. He breaks it. I'm going to say some stuff that's ridiculous now. He breaks it. First guy to break all the laws. Also the first chemist. He's the first guy that ever worked at Clicks Pharmacy because he was carrying tablets. And uh, he breaks all the laws in one shot. He breaks all the laws. I feel the anointing of God here. Yeah, I feel like... Just quickly, I've just, I just sense God's presence here. Just switch your hand. Just to switch, reach your hands. Just say, Father, we welcome Holy Spirit. We welcome Holy Spirit. And he, and he breaks, he breaks, he, he breaks these laws. But he's just been with the presence of God. The only guy ever to see God face to face. Moses sees God face to face, literally. He sees the glory of God. He goes onto a mountain. He leaves three million people behind. He goes onto that mountain alone. One man among three million people to be in the presence of God, to get something from God. How radical is that moment of separation? And it's right there in the, in the mind of God. The mountain is burning. Mount Sinai is burning. The people downstairs are burning their gold, making a calf because they don't know what's going on. And here's this one man with the presence of God. Isn't it amazing that when one man decides to climb a mountain, while he is seeking God, others are making idols. They're all serving, but they're all serving in a different way. But these guys are making idols. While one is seeking the face of God, a whole generation is making idols. What church are we going to be? Are we going to be that church that climbs that mountain? Or are we going to be that church at the bottom making idols out of euros and idols out of our old lifestyles? Because all of the gold that came on that gold calf was Egyptian gold. It was the gold that was in the earrings. It was their slave gold in their noses. They took all that stuff out, all that jewelry out, Egyptian jewelry, and they made a golden calf. And Moses is up there, and he's having this incredible, he's just had a burning bush experience, 90, 90 odd days, I mean literally, it was almost seven, seven or nine months, seven or nine months of plagues. It, some people think it was like three days, it wasn't, it was almost a year of plagues going in and out, you with me, um, bartering for a whole generation to come out. And then eventually they get set free, now they, they, they get, they're coming through. And now it's almost like a year of traveling through um, and a delay of so many days over a year on this mountain. And, and then a whole lot of days before they get to the, the first crossing, you know. It's a long time, you know. They, they, they're really having to, a long time. It's a long period of time. And Moses breaks the laws. Now, now you need to listen to this. And then they go back up. He goes back up the mountain. Can you imagine being with God, carrying what God gave you, than being disappointed by life. To find that everything that you ever dreamt and everything you've ever been given to by God was broken because of the influence of other people. That other people had affected you so much that you actually lost that victory. Am I speaking to somebody tonight that has actually lost a victory because of somebody else? Is there anybody here? If you can just wave your hand at me. Let me see. One person, two people, three people. The rest of you are all angels. You're like, brilliant. But most of us have lost victories. You can be so excited now and then come home to a negative attitude and lose your victory. You can have a move of God happening to you right now and tell another pastor, hey, you know, this is happening on church. And that guy can degrade you right there on the spot. And right there you can break everything that God gave you. It can just break. Your heart can break. It doesn't have to be the law. It could be anything else. And so that's why the New Testament says, don't confer with flesh and blood. When revelation was given to me, don't con I didn't confer with flesh and blood. And you have to hide. Sometimes you have to hide. The, uh, I see you playing piano and I see you singing and I see you. It's wonderful. And, uh, and, and, and sometimes you need to just hide. You need to hide. Sorry, I just kind of look at that. Thing. Just hide, hide, hide. And he breaks it. He breaks it. And he goes back up. He goes back up. Watch this. He goes back up the mountain. But this time God says, now you cut. You cut the stone. He cuts the stone. And the funny thing is, God goes again and he does it a second time. He gives the law again. 
He does it again. He gave them the same experience again. Isn't that crazy? And he comes down a second time. And that's what God was saying to me. saying to me, you know, if, you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're a seeker of the presence and something gets in the way, you just go and seek him again. You just go to seek him again. But what we don't know is what the Jews did. You see, the Jews never believed there were three things in the ark. Did you know that? They never believed that. They, although the Torah, the, 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 Torah, the Torah said that there were three things, the Jewish rabbis never believed that. You see, for God, any act of God is so sacred that even the broken tablet was sacred. A lot of people didn't know that. The broken tablet is so sacred to the Jewish people that even though it was broken, it is still sacred because it was written with the finger of God. It was God himself doing it. So when Moses took the tablet, the story goes that he took all of the law and all of the tablet, the broken tablet and the whole tablet, and put it in, all of it. Which is radical because the law had to be broken. And Jesus came to break it. He came to break the law, to fulfill it. Isn't that amazing? It's like, you know, that's why he healed on the Sabbath, because he broke the rules. It's a, it's a unique thing. I don't know, he didn't break the sin, but he broke the, the ordinances and the bondages of law. He gave us a, the law of life in Christ Jesus, which is free. And then there's a bowl with manna, a golden bowl. So it's not just manna, it's a bowl as well. So there's a bowl and manna. So there's manna, golden bowl, manna, the broken tablet, the tablet, and... <laughs> the rod of Aaron. So the Jews believe there were five, which is the fivefold ministry. But it was hidden. It was hidden. Grace was hidden. So we've always believed there's three, but there was more than that. But we, we only need the three because it, it, it gives us, but there's a mystery in all of this. Isn't it exciting? That there's these mysteries and these pictures are there and they're not there, but they are there. It's like hidden in the gospel so we can, so a generation like this could come and see that, that God's going to give us something much more. The, the golden bowl that hold the manna was the church. Because it holds the revelation of all of us. The bread, the body of Christ. And the broken and the restored speaks of the season of grace. That that which is broken can be restored. Aye. You're not getting it. It's together. That which is broken can be healed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Moses gets this radical revelation. And he puts it all in the ark. And it's casio, it's wood, overlaid with gold on the inside and the outside. Wood represents mankind, humanity, our flesh. So it's gold on the outside and gold on the inside. Ouch. So we have God on the outside and we have God on the inside. And in between we have flesh. Christ in me is the hope of glory, but the glory of God. Arise and shine for the light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. So the glory has risen upon you. It's on the outside of you. And it's also on the inside of you. The people of the presence. Whew, the people of the presence. <laughs> the people of the presence will have God on the outside. And they'll have God on the inside. And somewhere in between that will be the crucified flesh. That's why the Bible says, I no longer live, but it's Christ. For I was crucified with him. Right? If I was crucified with him, I died when he died. My flesh died. Now I'm only living in faith. My flesh is only living in faith. I'm living in faith. Because he's living now. So all of that stuff is wrapped up in the ark. There's four bars, two bars. And each bar represents the four corners of the earth, which means this box represents something more significant than what you and I can imagine. It represents the presence of God. You see, what makes us the people of God is not that we worship. Buddhists worship. Hindus pray. What makes us the people of God is not that we gather. The world gathers. Well, a rock stars gather. Thousands of congregation members. And clubs. <laughs> They gather hundreds of people. So gathering people is not a big deal. What makes us the people of God is that we're the people of the presence of God. 
It's the presence of God that makes us who we are. And then God takes this whole presence. Watch this. He takes this whole presence. And he gets these two priests to come. And he gets a priest to stand on this side, a priest on this side. And they have white e-pods because they're holy. And they pick up. and They put on their shoulders. They put the whole ark on their shoulders. Then Jesus, he, 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 he gives us all these clues. He says, and the government shall be upon his. You've got to get a revelation. He says, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. So if the government is upon the shoulders of Jesus, then he's not talking about the world government. He's talking about something else that will govern. And the only thing that was ever on the priest's shoulders was the ark. Therefore, the ark of the presence of God is the governmental structure of God. It's what God will use to govern a territory. Uh, are you getting a revelation here? All that talk about that weird stuff is coming to the point. It's that <laughs> you've got to get a revelation. The government of God is not politics. The government of God is a divine rulership of a people who know how to carry him. Those that know how to carry the ark of the covenant or the ark of his presence, they have the power to put it on their shoulders. And they carry it on their shoulders because the government is resting. And there's four men carrying it, which represents north, south, east, and west, the four corners of the earth, that the glory will cover the whole earth. Amen. These men, this priesthood that is coming, this new generation that's coming, are carriers of the glory. But they're not just carrying the, 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 the tablets that are broken, the brokenness of our past and our lives. They're carrying the, the thing that was made whole, the thing that God gave you this whole, the hidden manner, the revelation of God, hidden manner, and the rod of Aaron, which is the seal of your calling. Amen. And the authority of God. Isn't that amazing? All wrapped in this box. And on top of this box is this two cherubim, which is two angels, and they cover their face, this one and this one like this, and they're facing each other. They cover their face because they don't want anybody to see them. Cherubim cover their faces because they don't want their glory to be seen above God's glory. That's why you'll see the angels in heaven have got wings over their faces because they don't want you to see their glory. They only want you to see the glory of the one that brings the presence. It's all about him. It's all about him. And it's not only just those two angels guarding the door because there's, there's more than... I know I'm speaking a lot because I'm weird, but there's not three doors in the tabernacle. That's not true. There's four doors. <laughs> but the fourth door is hidden because there's so many things hidden. You know, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And the Jewish rabbis always believed that the first door was the way, second, the truth, and the third one was the life because there was a perfect light shining where the Ark of the Covenant was. Amen. So the priest would go through the first door, the second door, and the third door. But in the Holy of Holies, there's a fourth door. No one sees it. It's hidden. It's a fourth dimension. It's only reserved to this generation. Otherwise, no other generation has ever come here. You're not getting it, eh? Yo, maybe I'm just the only mad person on the planet. Nobody ever will preach what I'm preaching. And you've never heard it before. Because no other generation was given the scroll. This generation has been given a scroll to unlock. There were things that we never saw. We never knew. Never knew. The past generation of our teachers never ever spoke about the rabbinical thought of the law. Would you think? Do you really think the Jewish the holy men of Israel would take the law, even though it was broken, and throw it away and bury it. If it's that holy, God's holy, with his own hand, God wrote it. They would put it into a precious thin and hide it and protect it, wouldn't they? So when Moses put the law, he put all of it in. Broken and whole. <laughs> And so when we come out of the ark of, when we come out of the garden, God puts two angels, one on the left and one on the right, to guard the way to the presence of God. And then God takes those two angels and puts them on top of the lid of the ark 
to guard the fourth door, which is the lead. The way, the truth, the life, and then the lead is another door. So when you open that door, you can see the manor, because it's a lead. But we don't see it as a door. But yet it's a fourth door. And there's this generation that's here now that, the, that have never, no generation has ever gone this far as to get into the presence of God to actually peek into the very thing that makes the presence. Every other generation, they had the way, the truth of life. They came into the Holy of Holies. But they never embraced the fullness of that box. That's why this thing about the presence that you're talking about, are you with me? It's so far-fetched, bro. It is so futuristic. It's like you're way too far ahead. That's why I'm excited. Because there's more to this thing than just me saying kumbaya. I'm becoming something. You are going to become something. We're going to see acts of God. And, 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 and what I'm about to say now is going to blow your mind. Because this is the best part coming. And so we now have this lid, which is the fourth. It's really exciting. It's hidden. And we have the two cherubim that's guarding the way to what's in that. Because what's in there pushes us back into the garden. Because it speaks of that divine place in God. And then he gives it to these, he gives it to these priests. He gives it to the priests. And they come. They come. And they can't cross into the promised land because the same people that made the calf are the same people seeing giants. Watch this. This is radical. It's like radical. I, I, I can preach to myself right now. It's so radical. And then, you know, what happens is they see all the giants and everything. They see the obstacles in the promised land that God gave them. It's land. It's theirs. They come back. They come back. And Joshua and Caleb say, no, we can take the land. Joshua and Caleb say, we can take the land. And the others, they say, no, we can't. We can't. Then God says, now go take them to the desert and kill them. I'm going to get rid of all of the doubters. I'm going to get rid of all the unbelief. Because there's a move of God coming. A supernatural move that's coming that needs a sifting. It needs a sifting. And I'm going to come to my church and my true bride. And I'm going to start to sift. And when you start seeing people disappearing, don't get irritated. God is sifting. So only those that have pure faith, amen, they have great faith. Those that have been ordered to, to get this thing will stay. Not everybody's going to get it. Trust me. Not everybody's going to get it. So they go back into the desert. They take the ark of the covenant are you listening to me? All the warriors, all the soldiers, all the people that know how to fight, they have all the theology, all the people that are theologians, the people that have been mastered, they're radically educated by Pharaoh. I mean, do you honestly think that 300, 3 million people didn't have professionals? They were not all slaves. Some of those men were professionals. Are you with me? Some of them knew how to do crafts. And then a whole bunch of them were actually militants. They were soldiers that could fight. They were men. There were soldiers in Pharaoh's army as well that were Hebrews. Not all of the Hebrews were slaves. There's a vast amount of engineers there. There's a vast amount. Are you with me? They all go back into the desert and God says, Now, I want you to make sure everybody dies. So that generation that was born in Egypt goes back to the desert. Forty years go by. This is like a radical, radical sifting of God. You've never seen any sifting that has ever done so intensely to preserve the glory of God. And they're dying. And generals are dying. And militants are dying. Soldiers are dying. Men that were great and powerful. I mean, these spies that went to the land, these English guys were small little boys. If, just, just let's bear witness. Can we bear witness quickly? If you're cutting stone from a little boy, how big do you think you are when you get to the age of 30? Do you think you're going to be small? No, you're going to be like a, a farmer that's in the Transvaal. Are you with me? You're going to pick up a tire with one hand and throw it. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen, I've seen Afrikaans men pick up a tire and throw it like into the back of a back. I pick up the thing. My arm stays behind. 
These men are big. They're strong. They're buffles. <laughs> yeah, if you were in the war, you know what I'm talking about, a buffle. And, uh, and here we come. And God takes them back. And he says, I don't want an educated nation. I don't want a nation that thinks I know everything. I don't want a nation that's too powerful. I want people that have got nothing except me. Because with those people that have got nothing except me, I can do something supernatural. They go all the way back to the desert for 40 years. Those men that know all the theology, they know how to plant those churches. Who I'm saying, sorry, pastors, I didn't mean to be bad. It's not you I'm talking about. I'm speaking in general as a prophet. It's not my fault. I say these things. I just can't help it. And one by one, there's an exodus that takes place. The greatness, they pass away. They die. They go. And young men like this start getting born. Come. They're getting born. But they're not getting born in Egypt. There's no Egypt on them. They're born in the desert. A whole, come here, Franco. A whole generation like this. They have never been to Egypt. I know what Egypt looks like, and you know what Egypt looks like. But they don't know. They have never been to Egypt. And that young man over there, come here. Come quickly. Here, come. Just quickly, just stand with him. Just, and that young lady over there, and you, come. Just come, yeah. I'm just trying to make an example. I don't want to show you something. To sustain you. And this is whole generation. And some of us. And they never born in Egypt. But we were born in Egypt. The Joshua and Caleb's. We're still alive. You're over 40 years old. You know what I'm talking about. You're still here. Because there's actually the spirit of Joshua and Caleb on us. Because as much as this generation is born in that place... They still need to have leaders. And here's this generation they're born in, but they're not born. You're not born in Egypt. There's no Egypt in you. You're born in freedom. It's like a whole nation is born in freedom. Does that sound familiar? And when you were born, when you, when you start to see up the first time, what do you see is a cloud. When our generation woke up, what did we see? We saw Pastor Pharaoh. Our generation saw slavery. Our generation learned certain things and we thought they were the right things. But we didn't know we were enslaved to a system to build a man's kingdom. Not all of this generation, but most of us. Denomination does that to us as well. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, but it's the truth. But now there's lots of freedom happening coming. I mean, I'm, I'm getting into trouble probably. I'm probably in deep, so much deep trouble now, it doesn't matter. I'm so deep in the trouble right now, I'm probably <laughs> fired already, but it's fine. And this generation, look at them. They're born in the glory. They're born in the glory. Shoo! The glory of God's on them. Even though he's not aware of it, even though this generation might not be aware of it, the cloud of glory is over them. They're a generation of the presence. They don't even know. That's why they can't sing the songs we used to sing. That's why the songs that we sang in the beginning are irritating them because it doesn't speak about the presence. They need the presence. They need Jesus. They need the glory. Our songs are not singing those things. Our songs, Father Abraham and many sheep. They don't want to sing Father Abraham. They want to sing, I'll sing my hallelujah in the mercy of my enemies. That's what they want to sing. They want to sing these songs. Are you with me? And these songs are ushering a new era in the church. It's a whole new dispensation is coming. And they end the glory. And when it's getting hot, the cloud of glory is over their heads. Do you have music you play in the background? Put something softly on there and, and softly, just softly, just so that I can feel lovely songs. And so this glory is like above them. So they are covered by the presence of God. Watch this in the desert of their lives. Covered by the presence of God in the desert. That's why this generation, don't you feel as a generation that your generation is just different? You feel it? Everybody knows it. It's like 
That's why like you guys go clubbing in the desert, man. It's like you go and do these trance parties in the desert and you go and do some crazy stuff and, and yet you think differently and you see differently and you don't see what we're seeing and we irritate you. Our generation's irritating you because they're so slow. And you want to be, when you come in the presence of God, you want to be in the presence of God. You get irritated by all the talking. You just want Jesus. Because when you look down, you just see manna. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to do nothing. You don't have to work hard. You just look down and there's manna just everywhere. So you wake up in the morning and you just pick up manna. And you have this glorious thing of, of the presence, this generation, this glorious thing of the presence. And while the poor canes are dying, this generation is coming alive. And the Billy Grahams are passing away. And this generation is alive. And the John Paul Jacksons are passing away. And this generation is still alive. Oh. The Derek Princes are passing away. And this generation is still alive. Unlike that generation, that generation never crossed. They never crossed. Derek wished he crossed, but he never crossed. Because the generation that was around him had doubt and unbelief. Kim Clement never crossed. He passed away. Kobus from Rensburg, he's no longer here either. I can mention hundreds and hundreds of men of God which were our leaders in our generation. Miles Monroe, Dr. Miles Monroe, all these great men that were going to lead us into the promised land, but they never got there. And yet, there's still a Joshua and a Caleb. A Joshua and a Caleb is still alive. There are still pastors and prophets, there are Joshua and Caleb's that recognize I need to cross, but I need to cross with those that are not born in Egypt. I need to cross with those that are born in the glory. So this whole shift that you have in your heart is a God divinely bringing you to a place that you can get your whole body under the cloud. Is this rain? Ah, it's too much. Mandira moturu bhatta samate. I'm so desperate for God. It's unbelievable. Thank you for the rain, Lord. And so this generation now, this is it. They're uneducated, although they're educated. But they're not educated. They're not warriors. None of them have been trained in warfare. They don't know how to pick up a sword. They don't know how to fight. They don't even know how to use an arrow or a bow. Because this generation was not taught to fight. They were taught to love. It's a whole different generation. Our generation, we were, sight, we were singing songs. They were up to fight. Amen. We were fighting still. But this generation is not a fighting generation. They carry a generation. It's a big difference. So now, every single one of the great men are gone. And it's time now for the Joshua and the Caleb's to lead this generation into what the other generation was supposed to have. But because they had theology problems and because they had denominational problems and because they had lots of other issues, are you with me? They could never promise, get the promise to possess lands and nations and cities and regions and live out the glory of God. And Joshua, after the last man dies, God says to Joshua and Caleb, right now, take them. Let's go. Watch this. They're uneducated in the area of this realm. They've never fought a battle in their lives before. There's only one problem wrong with this generation. There's one problem wrong. You were born in the desert. You have not been circumcised. That's the problem. The problem is... We are trying to build a church with this generation. But they have not yet understood how to cut covenant yet. And because we have not discipled this generation into cutting covenant, there's no movement for revival. Because revival, listen to me, revival, every revival that ever took place, took place with young people. Everything that ever changed in the history of the world happened with young people. Look at it. South Africa, it happened with young people. In Moscow, it happened with young people. 
We as Joshua and Caleb, amen. We need to embrace this generation in a serious scale. Are you with me? Head on. And we as leaders have to cut covenant with them and teach them how to cut covenant with God because they have not yet been circumcised. The generation that came to the Jordan first who couldn't cross over, that was the first circumcision. But now we are coming into the order of the second circumcision. It is the greatest time in the earth. Because what's going to happen is God's going to come to this generation. Are you with me? And before you cross over, amen, He's going to cut a covenant with you. Well, He's going to cut a covenant after you cross. But He's going to show Himself to you. And he's going to cut the covenant with you. Amen. But He's going to cut the covenant with you, with you in the promised land. Did you know that they were not cut? Listen to me. They were not cut. Not one person was cut on the other side of the Jordan. They were cut on the land of the Canaanites. In the enemy's land, they were cut. And the enemy did not attack them once. Because it's a generation that doesn't need to fight the way we used to fight. It's a generation that knows not by might, nor by power, by spirit. Sit down, my generation. Sit down. What's coming is bigger than you and me. But we have to guard it. Because it's a big. So what Joshua did was this. Are you ready? I hope you received the impartation. I hope you received something from the spirit. You have a responsibility to change nations. To become the leaders in government. To become leaders in education. Are you with me? The rest of us. Yeah. You and I better stay alive. Are you with me? And be the Joshua and Caleb's to this generation. Do you know that when Joshua and Caleb came to the river, you know what they said? We were as young as we were when we first got here. Do you know that 40 years of aging stopped? They stopped the, the process of age because they said we are young. The same age we were when we first got here, that's how old you are now. Although they were 80, they felt like they had the strength of a 40-year-old. There's a supernatural grace taking place. Amen. If you are Joshua and Caleb, you won't age. You will stop aging. You will look like you are, but you will feel your body, your organs, your insides will feel like an 40-year-old. Say amen. Watch what he does. Are you ready, guys? Please listen to me. The first generation were afraid. They ran away from the giants. The second generation, this generation, this presence, the move of the presence. Joshua says, take the Ark of the Covenant. Let the presence go first. The first generation said, let our strength go first. Let our own human ability go first. Let our mighty men of war go first. Let our eloquent speakers go first. Let our eloquent worship go first. Let our elegant preachers go first. Let man go first. And the result is they reaped man. They reaped man. They reaped the fact that man would let you down. And we've blamed the church for failure. It wasn't the church that failed us. It was the men that we followed that failed us. Jimmy Swaggart's failed us. Not the church. The church is God's plan. It's always been God's plan. But it's supposed to be the place of the presence, not the place of pastor me and prophet me. But the presence. You're on track. You just don't know how close you are to hitting something that's bigger than you'll ever imagine. And so he says, let the presence go first. Now watch what happens. Remember, the first generation had fear in. They feared the giants. This generation, young man, born in the glory, eating the manna of the glory. They send the four men ahead with the ark. As they touch the waters of the Jordan, now you must remember the Jordan is a wide river. The Bible says on both sides, the left and the right, it stops flowing, both sides. They stand in the middle, watch this generation, they carry the glory. They stand in the middle because they know intercession. They know how to stand in the gap so that the whole generation can come through into the promise. Instead of trying to get the promise themselves, the people of the presence, they know 
I'm going to stand here in the middle of this Jordan until all my brothers that were in the clubs and all my family and my friends, everybody comes through first. And at that time, it's about 2.5 million people cross over. And on the hills of the Canaanite towns, your Moabites, your Hittites, your Cushites, your Amorites, and more than anything else, your Canaanites, the mighty warriors that put fear in your fathers 40 years earlier are standing on the hills and they're looking down at what's happening. And they see this massive nation, this massive nation of revival. This massive generation that are coming in the millions, born under the glory, fed by the hand of God, shouted, provided for, who are carriers of that box called the presence. And the enemies that attacked the previous generation, the Bible says when they looked and they saw the water drying up on the left and the right, the Bible says that fear entered their hearts. Read it. The Bible says fear entered their hearts. These warriors that have been trained in battle since they were eight years old, fear entered their hearts. And then the Bible says, and no spirit was found in them. Do you know what that means? Not their strength. Every demon that influenced them, every false spirit that was around them that gave them the power to serve their foreign gods. The Bible says that their hearts, their hearts became, they, they're like weak. They melted at the sight of what they were seeing and no spirit was left in them. Otherwise, every spirit that they had left them. Imagine demons running from a generation is coming. Imagine a generation that causes the enemy's heart to, to break and causes the spirits of cancer and sickness just to get up and go without a fight, without a fight. Without a fight. Then, in the land of your enemy, like I said in your church, remember? In the land of your enemy, in the land of your enemy, God says, now circumcise this generation. Make the covenant. What? The previous generation would have said, if we all circumcise at the same time, the enemy can attack us and kill us because we all can't walk. Because when you circumcise, you're down. You're vulnerable. But this generation that's coming has the presence. They don't, they're not scared about being vulnerable because they know God will protect them. So they get circumcised in the land of the enemy. You know what? And the enemy does nothing. A generation that is not fighting the way the old generation fought because they're carriers of the presence and they understand that. Seven months go by. Seven months. And they healed. And not one military army attacks them from the Kurnshites, the Amorites, the Hittites, or the Canaanites because there's no spirit in them left. Because that thing just crossed over with them called the presence of God. That thing and all these things shall be added unto you. And all these things, that thing. Watch. Then God does the ridiculous thing with this generation. He says, let's get Jericho. But you're not going to fight. You're not going to do it the way others have done it. The revival's coming. But it's not going to come the way you and I thought. Walls are going to come down. But it's not going to come the way we thought. We thought we would have to get our soldiers together. And we thought we would have to get, you know, cannons, and throw fire over the walls. And here God comes and he says, no, 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 this generation of revival, I just want you to follow the presence. Don't worry about what others are doing. I feel I'm so drunk here. Eh? Just follow the presence. 
for us, Joshua and Caleb's, let's learn. Amen. Because these walls are going to come down. But not to might of our power, man. We're going to follow the presence. It's the presence. And sometimes the presence commands you to keep quiet. Think about it for a moment. Why would God tell the, this army that is born, this army that fights without an army? Does that make sense? Read your Bible, man. Check the victories that happens in Israel. They're insane. And even when there is a fight, it's like the weirdest fight. I mean, guys, seriously? What's with this Bible? The people of the presence, they're fighting weird. They just don't fight like the others fight. I mean, the gates of Samaria are full of your enemy. And four lepers chase 400 soldiers away. What's with this? It's just insane. Let's not even talk about how Gideon does. And let's not even talk about how many soldiers kill themselves in these battles. Let alone all the other prophets that come as well. Are you with me? And how much damage they do. It's just a different thing because it's the presence. But this is what I love the most. For six days, God says, keep quiet. <laughs> I like it. First day, he says, hey, just keep quiet. This generation, all they have to do is follow the presence. So they pick up the Ark of the Covenant. And God says, now don't do anything because this generation knows it's not you doing it. The last generation said they're doing it. They're the healing ministry. They're the prophetic ministry. That's not my generation. They like that. They like to be seen. Why do you think, why, have you not noticed that Benny Hinn was on a high level? Thousands of people following. Have you not noticed? And then suddenly when the shift came, he's no longer getting the crowds. He's, not, he's now just preaching to churches of 300 and 200. What happened? Did he lose it? No. It was a time for that. But it shifted. It doesn't matter how big you were then. It shifted now. Now we're here. We're here with, with multitudes of people being seen. And multitudes of people that never picked up a weapon. Picking up the word of God. That's you. That's you. You might say, ah, oh, but prophet, I've never preached. I didn't ask you to preach. I asked you to be quiet. But pastor, Andrew, I can't prophesy. I never asked you to prophesy. I just asked you to be quiet. Be still. And know that I am God. You see, sir? You. God's going to use you. More than anybody else. And it's going to shock. They can say, but this guy is always so quiet. He's just, he's just relaxed. He's just chilled out. Yeah. But he's quiet. But when he touches people, it's the presence that's going to heal them and deliver them. Watch, you'll see. You'll see it. God's going to do some crazy stuff in this church and in churches. He's going to take the people you least expect. That you thought that God would never use them because they can't speak. And that stillness, they can carry the glory. They might not say a lot of things because they might not be eloquent. But when they do, just say, in Jesus' name, because they've been with the presence, pop, they're going to see miracles. <laughs> it's, it's a non-puffed up, it's a non-entertaining generation. They're not, they're not entertainers. <laughs> the day of taking a, a jacket in your hand and slinging it around, going, hallelujah, the glory. Our days are over, man. Those are following, those are still following the old. That's way gone, man. Don't even go there. It's old. It's finished. It's finished. Come on, come on. Come on. Take it, take it. The, that thing. Yes. Because, you know, with blackouts, they don't have an anointing any longer. I'd like to see them do that. But the generation's coming now. Menamusukuro Bundre. The generation of the presence. They can just walk with the presence, man. And already fear enters into the demonic world. Already demons leaving, spirits leave. Just for this generation walking in. Because they're born in the glory, man. Carriers of the glory. 
Nothing, nothing else. Nothing else matters. That's when you take your finger and you start putting it into people's legs and there's bullets that disappear. <laughs> and everybody says, oh, it's supernatural. Please grow up, man. There's nothing supernatural about God being God. It's only the weakness of the human race that says, ah, oh, it's supernatural. But when God heals the sick, it's not supernatural, it's God. When God raises the dead, it's not supernatural, it's God. Acts of God. We say supernatural. God says me. <laughs> this generation coming is not going to say supernatural. They're going to say God. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. They're not going to say, hey, I prayed for that guy who got healed. They're going to say, look what the Lord has done. They're not going to say, I raised the dead. They're going to say, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. They're not going to say, I prophesied a word of knowledge like this. They say, look what the Lord said. Look what the Lord said. Look what the Lord has revealed. And when they build these churches, they're going to say, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. And if we wait a thousand years for this worship team, it's fine. When they do come, we'll say, ah, look what the Lord has given. <laughs> Hallelujah. Marum will say, how many people are hungry for that? Amen. You're hungry for that. You're hungry for that. Hungry for that. Hungry. Just, just hold someone's hand. Hold your wife's hand. Hold someone's hand. Just, just bear with me. I'm going to pray a little bit. Glory to Jesus. This thing's dangerous, man. We're not talking here about 50 people. We're talking about 2.5 million. We're talking about in one day, a massive army is going to come out of nowhere. Just appear. You see the, the, the drug thing that's happening, all that stuff? That's the old Egypt still trying its best. But even the guy that's on drugs is coming and getting saved. He's getting saved in the glory. He's born in the glory. You know, you've got to get that right. We can be a Christian and we can be born. We can be a Hebrew born in Egypt and we can be a Hebrew born. Are you with me? So I'm not talking about your sinful state. So when a preacher says to you, you're Egypt, he's likening it maybe unto your sinful state. That's okay. That's a paradigm. But in the prophetic, I'm talking about how were you saved? Were you saved in the house of Egypt? Or were you saved in the canopy of God? There's a big difference. The house of Egypt, which brings slavery, or the house of God, which is the whole earth, <laughs> which brings the liberty of freedom. Were you born, you know, begging for bread, or were you born with manna coming to you? Ah, there's a revival coming. So I'm like, today I'm like, okay, this is it. This is it. I'm like, this is it. I get this little vision, and then the Lord, in the vision, the Lord says to me, I want you to go to this thing. And he tells me, go listen to this. He tells me what to listen to. So I, I don't know how I do it. I go onto YouTube and I go to a friend called my friend and I go into his page and I see this, this little thing, which I'm going to share with you now while you're holding someone's hand so you can see how significant this is. In 2014, we began this process started. Very cool, right? Paul Kane is 89, almost 89. How old was 89? He's 89 years old. He's been suffering for a long time. How many of you know who Paul Kane is? Paul Kane is one of the, the radical prophets from a thing called the Kansas City Prophets. John Paul Jackson, Bob Jones. John Paul Jackson, Bob Jones, Paul Kane. John, no, not John Wimber. Um, John, um, Mike Bickle is in there, Rick Joyner. Some of those guys are around there, that generation. There's a thing called the Kansas City Prophets that started in the early 80s, 1980. Very unique moment in time. It was a time when, when Paul Kane was part of the latter rain move. It's, it's a long story, but just listen. Bear with me so you know where you are. The latter rain is your Catherine Cormans were there. 
um, your William Branham's before he made his mistakes. A very powerful generation that God raised up with incredible words of knowledge, incredible revelations, incredible miracles, incredible miracles. Catherine Coleman, powerful miracles. Paul Cain came out of that. Paul Cain's mother um, was carrying Paul. And Paul, um, she had a double problem in her lungs and a specific sickness that gave her two years to live. But during that time, she fell pregnant with Paul. Okay? The doctor said that the baby would die and she would die if she had the baby. She continued to have the baby. While she was pregnant with the baby, and the angel of the Lord appeared to the mother and said, you will have a, a boy. His name will be Paul. He will be a prophet of God. He will preach the word of God. He will usher in a, a season. And after the angel left, the atheist doctor, the atheist doctor, the atheist doctor delivered the child supernaturally. The child lived and the mother was instantly healed on the delivery. That woman lived till the age of 97. How many of you can feel that right now? What you were about to feel is nothing compared to what you're about to become. And so Paul Cain was born. The angel had said his name must be Paul. Gave an exact name. And Prophet Paul Cain was born. Paul was one of the prophets that had the greatest words of knowledge I've ever seen in my life. He would call out people. He would give words of knowledge. He was the leader of the prophetic. Paul comes, Paul comes to Mike Bickle in Kansas in the middle of summer. And he says to him, I'm coming to you on this date in the middle of summer to prove that I am sent by God as a prophet. The day I come to you, when I knock on your door, it will snow in the middle of summer. When he rocked up, he knocked on the door. He said, come outside. Paul was wearing a raincoat. Mike will tell you the story. We're working with Mike in Russia at the moment on stuff. He was in his short pants, huh? and, well, like summer clothes, <laughs> and uh, straight away it started snowing. <laughs> Pretty radical prophet. Snowing in the middle of summer, it was one of those freaked out situations. Never happened before, never happened again. But it was a sign. That started a thing called the prophets, of, uh, the Kansas City prophets, which was instrumental in prophesying Toronto, Brownsville, Pensacola. A lot of that movement started what we call the river movement, the joy of the Lord. Paul Cain being the oldest of that group. John Paul Jackson, he passed away at 61. Paul's 89. Okay, Young prophets don't live long nowadays, but hopefully this generation will live longer because that generation had to leave early because the mantles had to quickly get. It's a long story. You have to sit with me for hours. You, in Cape Town, I'll share with you much more of what's really happening. And so, and then Paul, Paul, are you ready for this? He's dying in hospital. It's 2014. He's dying in hospital. The Holy Spirit led me to get this. This is like, I never knew this. I only found out in a couple of hours. He's dying in hospital. He's dying, right? And he's got a broken leg because his bones were very messed up and he had a problem with his blood with sugar, I think it was. So he had really battled. Healing ministries always had this problem. So he couldn't walk with his leg. And the doctor that's in the hospital, just like his mother's doctor, was also an atheist. Can you believe it? An atheist. The doctor that's putting him, saying goodbye, go home, is an atheist. And the doctor that brought him to the world was an atheist. So he came into the world with an atheist doctor, and he's leaving with an atheist doctor. How freaked out is that? And the atheist doctor over there converted because of the miracle of his birth, and it's about to happen in his death. It's like Alpha and Omega stuff. It's like what happened in the beginning happens at the end. When a prophet lives, he lives his whole life as one, just one big oracle. It's amazing. Aren't you excited about this? So... Paul is dying. The doctor is in his private chambers. Only he and his assistant have the code for the gate to open the door to get into his private office. And he hears this. Peep, 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 peep. And the door opens up and Paul walks in. 
God gave Paul on his deathbed a word of knowledge. What the number of, of, of the, was for the... So he walked in. And now Paul's walking on the leg is broken. The doctor runs to him to touch him. And Paul says, don't touch me, don't touch me, don't touch me. I haven't gone yet. He was now between life and death. But he hadn't descended yet. He said, before I leave, I need to tell you this. Didn't you listen? Write, write this down. I freak me out. This is why tonight's meeting is like one of those moments where it's like, it's like just God everywhere. It's like, shh. Because I would not have known this if I didn't pray that five minutes and then quickly hear the Lord and then know exactly where to look and what to look for and how to find it. Because it was impossible. Then Paul says to the guy, he says, don't touch me, I haven't seen that. Then he starts to tell this doctor in the next two hours what's coming into the earth. 2014. He's telling the doctor what's coming, what generation's coming, what the move of God's going to look like, how this move of the, of the presence of God is going to be, how the presence is going to fill the earth, all these things. He's telling the guy in English and the doctor's writing it down. Writing it down. Then at about six o'clock, the doctor wakes up because someone's knocking the door. They, he opens the door and they say, no, Paul's passed. He's gone to be the Lord. And the doctor says, no, but Paul was here. He was here now. In here, we were talking for two hours. We were talking about what God was going to do in the last days. And he was talking and he was mentioning all these preachers' names and what they're going to do in the earth and what's going to happen. Then when the doctor looks at the paper, the only thing written in English is don't touch me because I haven't gone up yet. I haven't ascended. ascended. The rest of it is written in a weird language. They take it to an ancient uh, mythological writer to find out what language this is. It's ancient Arabic. It's almost instinct. The doctor wrote ancient Arabic. Oh, it was Paul. But anyway, it was written. Pages and pages of stuff written in ancient Arabic. Prophecy regarding this generation. This time that we are now living in. This moment where we are alive. Where we are living. When no generation has ever walked this close to the return of Jesus. No generation has ever been in so much trouble. Amen. And no generation has ever had so much of His presence in our lives. And God help us if we are a generation that's going to go back into the desert and die. Are you with me? And not see the promises of revival. And not see the promises of the death being raised. And not seeing the promises of, of God supernaturally, financially giving us an end time transfer of wealth. Because the wealth of the wicked has been laid up for the righteous. And we have not seen that yet. Why should we die until we see an end time transfer of wealth? Why should we die until we see our bank accounts overflowing with millions and billions and owning the banks? Because that's what the Bible says. The Bible says in the last days, God says, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. The sons and your daughters will prophesy. But it also says that, that, that the wealth of the wicked has been laid up for the righteous. That means there's a generation. The whole earth is growing with anticipation for the revealing of the sons of God. Otherwise, all the gold, all the silver, everything in the earth wants to be given to the sons of the presence. This is how close can we get to this thing? How deep can we get in love with Him? How far can we get into the presence of God to become like Him, to usher in this season? Can we do it? And to hell with what we've gone through, man. It's nothing compared to what we're going to get. So what? We made some failures. The broken tablet. But God knows how to go up and give us a tablet that's not broken. Because it's this generation. So I'm thinking, this is insane. But then I went further and I listened to the sermons that he preached two, three years before he died. Guess what he was talking about? He was saying, I'm going. But I want to tell you that there's a generation coming. And they are exactly like Joshua's generation. And they are born in the glory. And they don't know anything else but the presence of God. And God will tell them what they're going to get soon. 
I believe that we are alive right now to see things that we've never seen before. To see things that we've never seen before. My generation, they would merchandise. They would write a book about a bullet disappearing. They would make a movie about it. But this generation that we've been trained in now, we just stand back and say, it is the Lord. It is the Lord. So I'm in a meeting in Africa. I won't tell you exactly everything now, but I was in a meeting in Africa. 2,000 people just now, just recently, 2,000 people were present. And at the end of preaching nine sermons in a period of three days, nine, four sermons on one Sunday. At the end of the meeting, the, the man of God comes to me. He says to me, 2,000 people are present. He says, there's a couple that's brought their boy. He's 16. How old are you, young man? 14, 13? Shows you a big 12-year-old. 16-year-old boy. They bring in a 16-year-old boy to me who's got brain damage. Listen to me. Brain damage. Brain damage. What happened was, at a young age, the boy had some sickness. Um, so I don't know what it was that affected him. He went to hospital. And then what happened was, there was a lack of oxygen. He went out. He passed out or something. Or he went into a coma or some state. And instead of giving him enough oxygen, the oxygen didn't get to his brain. And so there was lack of oxygen in the brain, which caused some of his brain not to work. So he couldn't properly talk, communicate properly. Um, you would say he was, I don't want to use those words because I think they're vicious words. Are you with me? So I just want to say that the boy had the issue because his brain had no oxygen. And the effects of that caused him not to speak, talk, and slight movement of the heads and the hands and twitching and all that stuff. Are you with me? So he was not in a good place. At the end of the meeting, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. But there's something about the presence. We have to be that generation. So I told the pastor, bring, bring them in. And the boy came in doing his twitching thing and uh, tried to talk, couldn't communicate. Just looked around like weird. I looked at the parents and they said, well, we've gone everywhere. No one can help him. The doctors can't help him. And I just felt, oh, you got so much unbelief. You're like those guys trying to get into the promised land. You've got too much unbelief. This boy needs to get into his promise. I told the parents, get out. Just get out. Just get out. Got them out of the room. It was just him and me. <laughs> I closed the door, took my jacket off. In my heart, I said, Lord, give him a miracle. I don't know what to expect. Put the jacket on him. Put the jacket on him. Didn't pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Didn't pray anything. Just in the presence. The last piece of the anointing on me was my jacket. My jacket was soaked. Preaching nine times with the same jacket. Put on him. As I'm about to pray, he looked at me and said to me, Prophet, I'm healed. No, no, he, no, listen. He looked at me and he said, Prophet, I'm healed. No twitching. No shaking. None of that. No... Uh, he said, prophet, I'm healed. I said, okay, boy, I need to pray for you. I'm serious. I said, I need to pray for you. What's the problem? He says, prophet, I'm healed. I said, you're okay. I know it's an act of faith, but tell me the problem. He says, I'm healed, prophet. Perfect. I said, okay, call the mom in. I said, what's your problem with your son? She looked at her boy. She said, that's not my son. It's 30 years I've walked with God. I have never seen stuff. Never. I don't even know if it's possible. Bullets and stuff. And people being healed on the streets. This boy was retarded because of brain I didn't know he couldn't speak. I said, and mom said, no, it's not my son. So who is it? I said, this boy's perfect. 
The boy looked at me. He said, give me the mic. He tells me, give me the mic. I'm not. He walks out that office with a mic in his hand. About the 2,000 people. I'm freaking out. I'm like, the mother saying, no, but he couldn't do anything. He couldn't walk like that. He couldn't pick up the mic in his hand. He, he couldn't talk. He couldn't focus. He couldn't even speak English properly or communicate. In a long time, and God heals. He don't heal half, man. Not like the other guy in Johannesburg. And he heal, and the guy becomes a mother. God doesn't raise up a person, he becomes a mummy, man. God raised you up, you healed perfectly. I've seen resurrections. I've seen real resurrections. Not in my hands. Uh, I was a youth pastor in a church where a young girl died. She died. They were doing the death certificate. She was dead for like 40 odd minutes. They were doing the death certificate. And she got back up. And uh, completely healed. And she had asthma where the asthma had pushed her lungs up like this. Her lungs up and caused the heart to be bruised. And the heart collapsed and she died from that. Right? When she was resurrected, there was not a trace of asthma and not a trace of the heart being bruised. She said she's got three years to share the story that Jesus is coming back. For three years solid, she preached all over the nation telling them that Jesus is coming back. After three years, I'm a youth pastor. So I know, Edmund's daughter, I know this is a fact. The doctor that, that was with her on the, on the deathbed was a Muslim. He's a Christian today. Three years later, she said to the church, I must go now. Goodbye. Went home, fell asleep and went home. Gone. Died. Came back for three years. I've seen resurrections. Nobody I've ever seen resurrected is a mummy. <laughs> ever. Why would God raise you to be messed up? No, he raises up to be perfect. And so he takes the mic and he walks into the auditorium and he walks to the pastor. Now, everybody, I've never seen a hush like that. A hush. And he looks at the people and he says, I'm going to preach like Prophet Andre. Tells everybody, I'm going to preach like Prophet Andre. I've never seen anything like it in my life, my friend. The spirit that was on me came on him straight away. That jacket. It carried all of that anointing. It came on him instantly. He didn't just get healed. He got a portion of me to the point that he felt he wanted to preach. So he took the mic. He said, I'm going to preach like Prophet Andre. That's it. Now, when you have something like that happen in your life, you don't sleep for days. You only go home and you forget about sleep. And then God like, says, okay, let me keep you humble. So he cuts you over here. Stay humble, my prophet. Thank you, Jesus. And he cuts you over here, <sighs> pulls your stuff back in, puts something inside of you, makes you feel continual pain. He says, stay humble, Andre. But this generation is coming. If I'm part of the Joshua and Caleb generation, if I'm part of, if I'm the Joshua to this generation, and you're Caleb's and Joshua's, and you are that generation, then I can only say what Jesus is going to say. And you shall do greater things than this. And all we got to do is make sure that they stay in the presence. We must make sure that now they shut up for six days. And let God do the work. And shout only when he says shout. Because it was a shout for his glory. Amen. And the walls came down. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I just pray, Father, it's late. We want to go home. I apologize for your prophet, Lord. He sometimes gets lost in the presence of God. But thank you, Lord, for him. I appreciate him. Lord, bless Andre, Lord. There's hunger levels. Amen. Get ready to be used. Get ready to be used. Get ready to be used. Don't, don't, don't ever think, ah, Lord, I'm just going to be a normal man. Just be a normal man. Go to church, go home. Just survive the journey. <laughs> God says there's nothing about survival here, son. You're going to take over. My spirit come upon you, God says. My spirit and my power will come upon you in a new way. I'm going to sit here and prophesy to you. Just, the Lord says, my son, I'm going to pour into you a new dimension of my power. And of my grace. 
And God says, you're going to make a massive comeback. God says, like I entered into Jerusalem, God says. And everybody shouted when I returned. So the Lord says, when you return, the Lord says. For the Lord says, strange and peculiar phone calls will start to happen in your life. Unexpected supernatural phone calls will begin to happen from people you thought forgot about you. And those that have you thought forgot about you will be reminded about you, says the Spirit of God. Even tonight, the Lord says, I'm going to begin to overshadow some very important people. And I'm going to begin to show them your face. And they're going to look for you. And they're going to find you. And God says, this season of drought is over tonight, says the Lord. And the Lord says, as I do this miracle for you, know it's done in my presence for my glory. And the Lord says, you will not suffer the shame of disgrace. You will lose no more things. And God says, I will resurrect that which looks dead. And I will cause it to come out of its grave. And God says, I will show you off in covenant. And the next season, God says, in the next couple of months, they're going to, in the next couple of years, they're going to, the next three years, they're going to say, but how did this man do this? How did he come back like this? And God says, it's because in my presence and in my anointing, God says, you've made sacrifice for me. And because you've made sacrifices, the Lord says, my eye is on the sparrow. And tonight, my eye is on you. And because my eye is upon you, I will make some people phone you. <laughs> And offer you things that you would not even expect. And the Lord says you will rejoice much. The Lord says although it's been a difficult season. The Lord says you will still rejoice in me and my victory. But the Lord says just a little bit longer. And just a little bit longer. And you're on the other side. Just a little bit longer. than you're on the other side. For death has been sorted up in victory tonight. Says the Spirit of God. Death has been cancelled. And life and chai has come. The goodness of life. And that which would ever seek to hurt you or harm you or, or destroy you has been broken by the power of this prophecy. I preserve you with my grace and with my anointing. There are things I want you to do, says the Spirit of God. I want you to cleave stronger to the man of God. I want you to learn, 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 learn and grow. Well, the power will come upon you now. It will turn you into a different man. It will turn you into a different man. Don't worry about all the people that rejected the things. Leave that. Leave it now. Forgive that. Forgive those that didn't see the blueprint, the vision. God says, I breathe wise men to find you. I breathe wise men to find you now. And you know that God is true. No man can know those things. And this is by the Spirit of God. No man can know those things. No man can know those things unless they're by the hand of God. For I called you tonight. I title you tonight, the Good Shepherd. I title you tonight, says the Spirit of God, to feed my sheep, to tend my lambs. For the Spirit of God says, my burden upon you has been, it has been hard, it has pressed you down. And no matter what you do, it will never be successful until you yield to do my perfect plan. Oh, Shepherd, how have I not called you? Have I not called you into the chamber? For like Nehemiah was called to go and restore the gates, so the Lord says, Son, I have called you to restore the wall that has fallen down. For no one, no one can see how broken these walls are, how broken my church is. Not here and there, but everywhere, every place of that wall. And like Nehemiah, son, I've called you to restore the walls that are broken. Tonight, the Lord says, like Nehemiah, I give you a letter. In the spirit, I give you a letter signed by my authority that no man will touch you or harm you on your journey to start restoring these gates. 
The first gate, God says, is the sheep gate. <laughs> that first gate is the sheep gate, says the Spirit of God. Don't be impatient. You are one that will be sent. Do not be impatient. You are one that will establish. Do not be impatient. The Lord says, do not be impatient. The restlessness that you're feeling, God says, is that the baby is heavy inside of you. You are heavy pregnant, son. You're like eight months pregnant. It's in the spirit. It's like a month more in the spirit. It could be some time, but the baby's head is pressing down. And you're feeling uncomfortable. But an uncomfortable is not rebellion now. It's not rebellion. That uncomfortableness is, is the burden to birth. Don't try and be a prophet. Don't try and be an apostle. Don't do those things. Be frustrating me. <laughs> Just be the shepherd. Be the shepherd. Be a shepherd. Be a shepherd. Be a shepherd. Just love. This is the season to love. In your brokenness. In your brokenness. With you. Look after him well. He's a bit frustrated. He feels like his time has come. He needs to do something. But he's got some more time, just a little bit more. I don't know how long that month is. A year to the Lord is, uh, what, a thousand, a thousand years. So a month, uh, I don't know how long that is. Say yes and your finances will be solved. Your finances are solved now. You see, all God did was take your finances away. Am I right? So that you could live by faith and get to this point of yielding. Now you're really broken. Because before you were too much. You knew too much. You could finish people's sentences. Am I right? Hmm? Now you can't. Now you're perfect. You're a perfect broken vessel. You're a perfect, perfect broken vessel. Reach your hands towards this perfect, perfect broken vessel. <sighs> that music I can't hear. Perdimos samu to hear it. Marano son toro bobo son chana mantrong. What happened at the back? Is he raptured? <laughs> Hallelujah. Just wait. Wait. Wait on him. Wait on him. Wait on him. Wait on him. That's good, man. That's good. Just wait on him. Wait on him. Wait on him. Wait on him. Just healed. 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 There are many, many churches coming out of your loins. I drove in here. The Lord says, I'm going to put you in the middle of the city. God told me, I'm going to put you in the middle of the city. The Lord says, you're coming out of hiding. And then I saw your land over there full of houses. I saw houses being built there. And the Lord said to me, I'm going to let you build houses so that the houses that you build will pay for the other projects. That's what God said. I don't know why you're looking there, but that's what God said. When a prophet comes, lives are changed. You have a great pastor here. You have a great pastor here. The word of the Lord to you is, yes. Yes, I've called you. And yes, this is the season. You live by faith. Because I've taught you how to live by faith. When heaven comes, 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 I prophesy many things to you, but you will be in and out like that now. Franco, you'll take his place soon. And take his place soon. His time's almost up with me. Just for a little bit, then I'll send him back. 
Thank you, Lord, for these daughters of Zion. Hold hands, all four of you, hold hands. Amen. And Philip had four daughters that prophesied. And I just saw these four girls here. Close your eyes, close your eyes, close your eyes. And Father, I just thank you right now that a spirit of prayer, a spirit of prayer and hunger will come upon them, Father. A supernatural, I don't even know how close they are, Lord, but make them very close in the spirit right now. I pray, Father God, that they will begin to see miracles. I thank you, Father God, that same anointing that was in Philip's daughters, Father God, that made Philip's daughters prophets will come upon them in Jesus' name. And if they hunger, if they hunger for it, if they hunger for it, visions will come, revelations will come, supernatural realms will come. Father, right now I unlock, I unlock the supernatural realm of heaven. I unlock, I unlock the glory of God. And words of knowledge will come. Words of wisdom will come. Visions will come. Dreams will come. Lord, they will open up the Bible, become extremely hungry. Just become extremely hungry. Just these four, no one else. I want you to say this, Father. Just these four. Say, Father. And say it louder, ladies. Say, Father, can you make us extremely hungry for revival? We want to see revival with this generation, with our generation. And we, Lord, are going to stand together for your name. And we're not going to, we're not going to bow down to the pressure of all those Jezebels. We are going to be shining examples of your glory. Use us for miracles. Use us to bring a whole school to revival. Use us to bring colleges to revival. Use us together to pray. What a glorious thing it would be. Keep your eyes closed, young ladies. What a glorious thing it would be to tell your parents, Hey mom, we're not going to have a sleepover. We're going to have a prayer over. Mara makashi gedabandara montre. Just like we used to do when we were young. Remember? Can you remember? When we first got saved, we used to have prayer overs. I still have them. Prayer overs. Don't have sleeping parties. Forget about sleeping parties. You're going to have vision parties. You're going to have vision parties. Get together, sleep over at a friend's place, play worship, amen, and go wait on the Lord. Begin to prophesy to each other. Begin to have visions. Our young men will see visions. Our young men. Young men, sons and daughters shall see visions. In the last days, these are the last days. Come on, you, you're a younger generation. I'm not talking about the Joshua. I'm talking about the, not Joshua and Caleb, the younger generation. Put your hands up to heaven. I don't even know what age you are. You can be 90. Caleb's, I'll talk to you just now. Thank you, Lord. Put your hand up, man. Leave your, oh, you can stay with me. You and I, let's stay together. Because you must lead them. Come here. Maramos, come here. Stand up. Put your hands to heaven. Thank you, Lord. Say more, Lord. Say more. All right, come closer. All right, say more, Lord. I want more of you. Thank you, Lord. Come over here, Yaku. Come out, please. Franco, come here. Yeah. Praise God. His heart is like, I wish I could hear his heart, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to buy one of those stethoscopes. Mando Brombonte, Brendiste, Santarono, the glory, Mabara Samanta Namatre, the glory, Manduro Mosentra Manterane, the glory, the glory, the glory, the glory, the glory, the glory, Manisa, Ramanesa, Serenisa, Hensonontre, thrown into a violent world, Mandish, the Sobranto Vente, in the world that is confusing, Paramount Taramanto, seeing and experiencing things that a young, young man like you who is not supposed to be seeing, seeing things that you're not supposed to be experiencing. Mambanda Semprende. And having your whole youth disappear in front of you. Just pieces of it just going. Do you hear me? Just pieces of it just going. And, and, and just the Lord coming and saying, I'm, I'm re-putting your life together, young man. I'm putting it back together. 
You're supposed to be dead, but you're alive. You're supposed to be rotting in the ground, but he's kept you alive. And poison was supposed to take you out, but it's leaving you. And life is entering into your blood. Life is entering into your nervous system. Your cerebellum, the back of your brain that stopped you from reasoning, from knowing what was right and what was wrong, has been staunched and burnt. But now the hand of God is healing the back of your cerebellum, right over here. Nerves that are going through your brain, the headaches are disappearing. The pain in your joints is gentlemen, Father. I thank you, he's been in the presence of the Lord this whole time, Father God, seeking and soaking in your presence, Father God. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would make a supernatural way, Father God, I know that we were supposed to close this meeting a long time ago, and I probably have. But, Father, I thank you for his life, Father. I thank you for his heart, Father God. I thank you, Father God, that you would surround him, Father God, with, with an incredible new season. So I prophesy to you a new season in your life. I prophesy and declare a new season in your life in Jesus' name. It's been long, eh? It's been long. Amen. Give me your, give me your hand. Father, I thank you. The Lord said to me, Son, Son, visitation time. Visitation. It's like the Lord saying, I want to pull you away and I want to show you things. Things that you've never seen with your eye before. It's almost like the Lord is saying to me that there are times that I've tried to draw you into a secret place and I've tried to draw you and then it gets so busy that you get to get to go back to the normal. So, cool. But I hear the Lord saying, come away for a moment now because there's some clarity I want to give you. I keep on hearing the Lord saying there's a bit of noise. He goes, there's a bit of noise. It feels like um, promises that have broken or plans that did not come to the way we thought they were going to come to. And there's a bit of brokenness in that. It's like, hey, Lord, have I failed now? Have I missed you there somewhere? What's going on? Um, and some of the stuff is divine delay. And other stuff is just the Lord just saying, just wait on me a bit more. Timing was out. But I hear the Lord saying, there's a real sense in my spirit for you to touch him again, to get close. Um, I'm, I know you're hungry for God. I know, I know you've always been hungry. But um, there's a special thing that God wants to give you, but you're just going to get there. You're going to get there. And uh, unless you get there, it'll frustrate everything. I think, I think he's on the edge. I think he's on the edge of something great but he doesn't know how to handle it. So a lot of strange things are happening. It's like, it's amper as, you know, you're here in the life. But you see things that you don't What's happening? Who's this man? It's like, there's a strangeness happening to you. It's like you're evolving. But you don't know what the evolving is happening. So you haven't discerned it yet. And because you're in the embryo of change, and you're in the embryo of moving to another realm in God, it's, it's a battle. It's a battle here for war. And it's, you can't even explain it. Even, even if she asks you uh, what's going on, you can't put it into words because it's too much. It's eternal. You'll only really know once it's come through. It's like you're carrying something, but you're not. You know what I mean? And the only way you're going to be able to s tell her what it is and let us see what it is is for you to, to go to the secret place and, and, and get the love of God required. And I believe this time is for that, but there's more time for that. All right? More time. I don't think you have to worry about him. I think what has happened is, I, I feel like he was a machine gun. I think for the last two, two years in his life, three years, he was a machine gun. And now he's becoming a sniper. And so instead of shooting like wild and hoping to hit something, it's like you're now becoming, you're training in the spirit as a sniper. You're training how to monitor the wind. You're training how to, to watch and then how to aim properly to use the right and then to hit the target exactly where it's supposed to hit. You're becoming more accurate in the dimension of your relationship with God. It's becoming, it's much more mature. Uh, the, the last time I saw you to the time I see you now, I think there's a maturity that's taken place, which is, is drawing you into stillness. It's, it's drawing into stillness where your, your words are going to be much less, but they're going to have much more power. And because there's that shift, it's almost like you're looking and you're like wondering, like, what's going on with him? He's, he looks like he's distant. 
He's not, he's not distant. He's just, he's getting wrapped up in God. Getting wrapped up in God. At the same time, you're getting wrapped up in God and you're doing your thing. She's in, in her crisis. It's like, I think she's in a crisis at the moment. I think it's like, it's like, I hate to say it, but it's like she's trying to survive here. Are you with me? As a, a year, trying to survive. And I, I, and I feel like the Lord is just throwing like this life, this life thing to you. It's like you're out, you're so deep. Are you with me? And the Lord's just throwing this thing to you and you're grabbing it. And he's going to start putting you, you know, into a safe place. Okay? Because it's so far out there in faith. You're so far out there that there's so much current that it's like, Lord, I can't even touch the bottom of the ground anymore. We're so deep in this thing now in my spirit. But Lord, I don't know. I need you to help me, reassure me that you're in this thing. And God just says, I'm going to show you, I'm going to throw you a lifeline. Right? I'm going to throw you a lifeline as a family. I'm throwing you a lifeline. You know what I'm talking about. I have no idea what I'm saying. Uh, throw you a lifeline and I'm going to pull you to a place of safety just so you can rest before you go back to the swim again. You just need a bit of rest. It's like you guys have been, not to each other, but out there. It's like for her, it's like she's been fighting a spiritual battle. And you've been like soaking you in this, in this realm. But she's hitting the spirit. She's hitting the forces of darkness. She's smacking them smack on. Sometimes she wants to pull you in and say, come help me fight you. But you're just like, yeah, you're just floating here. Because that's where you're at. And, and that's okay. But now the Lord just put you in. Give you a bit of time. Have a break. So you can fight again. But not, not yet. You need to just rest. So soak in the presence and get the mind of God on you. Enjoy the little push that God's given you. Pull you back in the shore. Amen. Get refreshed. Recover. Stitch up the wounds that you had in the spiritual war that you've been through. All right. Help her. Get healing. Amen. And then uh, communicate the next season. But there's a shift that's taking place. All right. Unfortunately for her, it's just starting. That thing's really just starting. Here's me. Because you really have to overcome so much now. You understand? You have to break so much through. So, amen. But it's okay. Don't worry about that. It's probably just the, the world saying, hey, we love you. And um, if Jesus wants to talk to you, the world wants to talk to you. Trust me. Um, you find the Lord, you seek the Lord, and you're going to get strong so you can fight again. You really are a fighter in the spirit. Amen. I don't think you would survive without your prayers. Amen. Praise God. So the spirit of God, you, uh, your family here? Yeah? All right. You have sisters, family? Not yet. In your life? Okay, all right. I feel, I, I hear the words family unity. I hear this word family unity. I feel like things have been distant. And it's been a long time. But I think God wants to bring things together, closer. Um, even though you say hello and goodbye, it's not like it used to be. Are you with me? There's something. Um, your, your sister, you say. Yeah, it feels like there's a cry, yeah from her there's something that she's facing that she can't handle I think this time you're going to have to be strong for her really have to be strong for her I don't think she's handling too much right now but she's strong eh? that one she doesn't like to tell you everything you're the one who likes to talk to me you talk to you know but you must be careful who you talk to okay the Lord is telling me um, don't worry about these are your friends but you need to be careful right in the past you spoke to the wrong people okay and you shared your heart with people who never really had a heart for you, okay? And so this is a season, amen. Um, I also see you working within an NGO, okay? I don't see you working full-time for them, but I see you as a partnership, are you with me? Helping, support, structure, are you with me? Um, you're going to have a lot of children around you, trust me. When I'm talking about children, I'm talking about young people, all right? Um, it's like, I, I don't know why I'm saying this, but... Um, I don't even know if you're married or you've got children, but this is what the Lord says to me, sing a barren woman. And I sing a barren woman. And it's like, more children will you have than the woman that could have children, or more children will you have than the woman that did have children. And so the Lord is speaking to me in my heart. I don't know what it means to you, if it means anything to you, does it mean anything? But the Lord said to me this, he said to me uh, to tell you that you're going to have so many children. 
But you, you, you're going to have the benefit of having children that you didn't have to change nappies for. <laughs> That's all it says. You're going to have the benefit of having children that you never had to breastfeed or change nappies for. God says you're going to inherit children that are just the real thing. So you're going to find a lot of children coming around you. When I say children, I mean you know, 16, 17, 18, even. Are you with me? And you're going to, just, you're going to have so much love for them, so much care. And you'll be working with Inside an NGO for that as well. And your heart is just going to, you really, your heart is really going to break, eh? Your heart, listen to me, I, I, I hate to prophesy all these weird things, but you've pretty much been a strong woman your whole life. You've had to be. You've had to survive. You've had to keep yourself together. There was a time in your life where it was so broken that you, you, even you thought that you were going to have a nervous breakdown. You thought that you were going to collapse, all right? And yet in this season, you've overcome all that stuff. But this is not the season to ever be hard again. God says, from this night, you're going to be so soft. You're going to be so soft. You're going to be known as a woman of, of great tears. And you're going to hear stories. Sweetie, you're going to hear stories. And you're going to listen to people because the spirit of counsel is also on you. And you're going to listen to people. And their stories are going to break you. They're going to hurt you. And you're going to just keep yourself. And you're going to go home, you're going to cry like Jeremiah. You're going to cry. And you're going to bring it for God. But you're going to have such a love. You're not going to love everybody. Trust me. You're very, very sure. You're very selective about who you let into your life. You're very selective in who comes in your space. Do you have a lot of dogs? Yesterday, because it's like a farm going on here. It's like I'm looking at you and I'm just like, it's like, it's like your spirit of adoptions on you. It's like it doesn't matter what's going on you. It's just like you're just adopting. You have a lot of children. I mean, you have a lot of animals, children. But the same way that you look for, after these children, these animals, the same way you're going to look after my children. Amen. Hallelujah. I just saw them all like running around like this. There's so much fluff going on here. Praise God. Yes, it's beautiful. You actually have a beautiful future. It's a glorious future. It's full of life. And you don't have to worry about being alone. You're going to have too much people in your life. But you're going to have to be a mother. Amen. Not in natural, but in spirit. Amen. Lord bless you. Amen. Pastor, bless the Lord. We can close the meeting. Let's need to go home. We can go home. I'm good. Hallelujah. He's good. <laughs> Jullie kom ons sit dit so vannacht het so, net so vroeg omlik, kom ons sluit het ons oor. Ons het maar een liekie dag het so, net nie begin, ek gaan om net so begin en dan. Ek het toe, toe ons oor die nawek bid het, ek het altijd het gevoel, ons moet net by die Heere sit en woordigheid kom sit en. Ek wil nie, ek het nie gekom vir andere nie, ek het ook nie, ons het nie so beplaan om hier te gehad het vanavond nie, so. Thank you, prophet, for you. Ja, 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 ja. ja. Much different, and we could, I can't jump up and down like I usually do. But I want, I want us to break this right. Something big is coming. Something, you got to trust me. Something so big is coming. It's, it's going to knock us into the glory, and we're going to miss it if we don't catch the wave. And we are getting ourselves to a place, God, where we're sensitive to know. I know that Passover, this, they call it Easter, but we call it also Passover, is going to be very significant. It's a three and a half year period after the prayer started. Okay? It's a long story. And I know what's coming is big. In the last 15 years, almost every single prophet has prophesied seeing massive waves hitting Cape Town. They like even to psalmers, they're thinking it's to psalmers, but we know what it is. We know it's the wave of God's glory. Are you with me? We know revival is coming, and that revival generation is coming. And we just want to be for that, we want to be hungry for that, you know, and desperate for it. And never before in my life, ever, have I been so desperate for it. So, so this church, this church is going to have some shockers. The, the leadership has been shifted and changed and altered. Um, is a chess piece going on. 
People that we thought, that you thought were going to be in places, are not going to be there. Then the land issue that you've got there, it's like everybody's saying, oh, plant this, build this, that thing. And then the Lord's giving you a gathering, like a major gathering. Are you with me? And so the Lord's going to put you in the center of the people, like literally in the center of the people. Don't be surprised if you have more than one. Are you with me? Don't be surprised if you have more than one. Don't be surprised if you possess even places like this in the future. Okay? Um, you, you have a period of time in this nation, Matthias. Your family have a period of time in this nation. And then there's a major call to the nations. So you have to, you have to really play out the next six, seven years. It's a very, very significant year to get this, this, this battleship right. Are you with me? Because the demand for you is too much out there. Um, and I know that period is right because if you add it to your son, you'll see why. Because that's about the time he starts to travel overseas to study. Okay? And God's doing some very significant things um, in your heart and in your life. Um, in the area of being a father, becoming a father, becoming a father. There's a second thing. You have leaven the word year. You have leaven the word year. And you're running with leaven the word year. But there's another umbrella over here that you will apostle over. You will always be married to the end of words in relationship. But there's another umbrella. And that umbrella is going to have a different shape. It's going to have a different look. It's going to do different things. Okay? There's going to be a lot of fighting when that thing starts to birth itself. Because some people are going to think that you're being rebellious. But I don't believe it's a rebellion. I think it's a different stream that God wants you to have. It's a, it's a, it's a different realm. Glory, but the the relationship with heaven will always be there. It will always be a part of the whole thing. But this that's coming here, it has a different shape. I can't see it too clearly. Are you with me? But it's definitely happening in a different shape. And in that in that thing, you become a father to a multitude of ministers, a whole a whole group of people. It becomes a real thing. Um, there's um. Yeah, there's a lot of land coming, like, you've got this land, but there's more land coming, like a farm land coming. There's more land coming, a, a farm that's established. It's almost like the Lord's going to give you a, a kibbutz soon. It looks like it, a real kibbutz. I'm talking about, like, it has in Jerusalem. Uh, they can actually plant and establish and greenhouses on there and tomatoes and cucumbers and stuff. Just the Lord is really going to give you the earth, give you the earth and toil the soil, okay? And the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God also told me that you and your wife, um, you were attacked major in ministry and that you've just come out of getting really healed, okay? Because the enemy tried to break your legs, tried to stop you from walking forward. Um, and um, it looks like a vicious attack against you in the area of your character. But the Lord has vindicated you. And um, he beat up that we tried to beat you up so that you can overcome. It's a new season coming now. It's a new season. Um, the, land itself will, will, the land itself will produce the money that is needed to produce the vision. The land. The vision is in the land. The land will produce it. Okay. Then this Bible Institute that starts. Okay. It becomes a major concern because people are going to come from all over the world to get training. So that's something that was put on the pipeline. It was like, it was a vision, part of the vision, and was shelved a bit. But that book has fallen out of the shelf, okay? So there's dormitories in the college coming. Africa is coming. African sons are coming to this Bible school. And they're going to get trained um, in missions and, and, and ministry and major church planting movement. There's so much the Lord is doing here, it's just unbelievable. It's just an overflow of so much that's happening. Um, watch out for, we'll do this and we'll do this, but we want to be a part of this and we want to do that. And if we give you this, then you must do this. Just watch out for that manipulation. But it looks like a, a, there's a king coming soon who's going to say, no, I will help you do this and do this. And, 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 and things are going to happen fast. It's like... As you look, you blink, it's going to be done. And it's not going to be done slowly, it's going to be done very fast. Very, very quickly are the bricks going to be laid. Very quickly are the things going to start coming up. 
It's like your season of waiting has just come to an end. Just quickly. And God says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. There's some, there's some documents that will look suspicious. Um, but the Lord's going to help you to get it right. All right. Put people around you to help you. That's going to be very quick. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of connection with you in Australia. A lot of it. Uh, a lot of it's happening here. Um, it's like you will become the base for a lot of Australians. This church is going to be full of Australians. Um, even in your worship team, you're going to have Australians on your platform. It's going to come to this country and spend like a year of their life. It's like a year of their life type of thing. I'm seeing New Zealand, Australia, and I'm even seeing some guys from, from the East coming. It's connecting. Um, the Spirit of God is pinpointing you here to challenge the spirit that enters into South Africa through the Buddhist temple. He's put you here to be a strong man. And because you're a strong man, you're the only legitimate strong man that can challenge all the spirits that are coming through that Buddhist temple.